Alexander the Great, Alexander III, king of the ancient state of Macedon, aka Macedonia, often heralded as one of history's greatest military commanders. But he wasn't only that, he was also a scholar, a lover of literature and the arts, a deeply religious man, and someone who had thousands and thousands of people killed. Uh, undefeated in battle, he unleashed his army on countries great and small to forge an empire that stretched over three continents, from Greece to India, as far south as Egypt. He did all this in little more than a decade after taking power at the age of 20 until his untimely death at the age of just 32. Alexander the Great was so great at destroying his opponents, his military tactics and strategies are still being studied in military academies today. But his conquests aren't all that make Alexander a fascinating person. His parents, Philip and Olympias, had their own fascinating lives. Alexander's close friends from childhood, including his best friend, Hephaestion, would become Alexander's generals and trusted advisors. And together they would battle a variety of formidable and fascinating opponents on battlefields and exotic lands they'd only heard whispers about before actually seeing them for themselves. In a culture that valued war over all else, Alexander prevailed by being the best at conquering. He did whatever was necessary to win and sometimes did things that maybe weren't so necessary. Cities were sometimes completely destroyed, priceless artifacts obliterated, all according to Alexander's sometimes mercurial will. So what made Alexander so great? What were Alexander's early influences? The people who formed him into the fearless leader who would become? How did Alexander and his father turn Macedonia from a tiny tribal kingdom into the world's most powerful empire? All this and more in today's ancient, bloody, this actually isn't Sparta, it's Macedonia, but it makes me think of Hollywood Sparta edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald and you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> you're listening. Happy Monday and hail Nimrod, meet Zax. Welcome to the Cult of the Curious Big Show for you today. I'm Dan Cummins, professional pot stir, meet Zach Ryler, Nimrod's caddy, Lucifina's full body masseuse, and you are listening to Time Suck. Hail Nimrod, don't leave Lucifina, good boy Bojangles, and where have you been, Triple M? Big Time Sucker updates, addressing a variety of opinions regarding last week's Riot Suck. Skip it if you're done with that discussion. Don't miss it if you want to hear so many different interesting perspectives on a complex issue that will continue to be talked about in society for a very long time. Uh, excited to get to that. Next week, the updates will return to their normal balance of messages ranging from uh, extra info, things I missed, things I messed up, to uh, Cummins Law victims. Uh, time Sucks, a four-year anniversary tee in the store today at badmagicmerch.com commemorating the strange 2020 summer of the stash. And uh, and thanks for, uh, you know, many of you recently checking out my, my new shows, Is We Dumb? And now also Incredible Feats. Those little quick hits of interesting and inspirational topics Monday through Friday. And that's it. And that's it. Quick, quick announcements today. Let's get into some very exciting, uh, you know, little chapter of history right now. Establishing fact from fiction in a story like that of Alexander the Great's uh, not easy. Uh, in some instances, not even possible. Uh, how do we tell the history of Alexander's life, pulling apart the myths and legends and reconstructing an accurate narrative? Well, we don't. Thanks for listening, everybody. Come on, JK. No, uh, we do our best. We do our best with the most accurate sources known to exist. Uh, the bulk of the ancient narratives written about Alexander's life were written between 30 BCE and the 3rd century CE, hundreds of years uh, after his death in 323 BCE. Long time for the telephone game to be played. Long time for the proverbial fishing tail to go from catching like a 8-inch, 2-pound rainbow trout to hooking a trout that didn't hop into the net. It stood up, walked out of the fucking lake, spit the hook into your face, and slapped you off the dock before throwing its six-foot, 250-pound fish frame back into the water. Uh, the earliest known proper biographical account of Alexander's life was written by the Greek historian Diodorus, who died in 30 BCE. And his account, like a lot of these accounts, I mean, there's probably a decent amount of exaggeration in it because they wanted to make him look even greater than he was. Uh, we also have histories written by other historians, including Roman historians, who did base their writings on accounts written shortly after Alexander's death, but... Uh, these are accounts penned by those who fought alongside Alexander on his campaign. So, of course, they were biased. They wanted to write glowing reviews so they, so they didn't get killed. Also, these narratives were mingled with the propaganda of various Greek and Roman states ruled by emperors that would use Alexander's image to cement their own power. 
so they would be uh, particularly biased. The authors had an obvious agenda to make Alexander's exploits, you know, uh, bigger and better. Uh, their, their empire's rulers wanted to hitch their wagons to the brightest star in history. They wanted to please their rulers to increase the odds that their heads remained on their necks. The better Alexander looked, uh, the better their rulers looked. The five oldest and most often quoted surviving accounts of Alexander's life were written by three Greek historians, Arian, Plutarch, Diodorus, and two Roman historians, uh, Quintus, Curtius, Rufus, and Justin. And these men didn't just write about a man. They wrote about a god. Alexander is remembered as a man whose shit literally didn't stink by Plutarch, who reported that a most agreeable odor exuded from Alexander's skin and that his breath and body all over was so fragrant as to perfume the clothes which he wore. Oh, boy. So maybe he didn't say his uh, literal shit didn't stink, but he might as well have. In addition to these five main sources, there is the Mets Epitome, uh, a late Latin work with an anonymous author that narrates Alexander's campaigns from Herkinia to India. Uh, no one knows exactly when it was written. I mean, I mean, I know for sure it wasn't written in 1989. I do know that. I know it was not written in like uh, May of 2003, uh, but I don't know exactly when. We, we know what, it was written a long time ago, just not exactly when. In order to get a more accurate picture of Alexander, later historians began to interpret sources not just for his successors and fans, but also from the lands of the people he conquered. These accounts help provide a, a bit of balance to Alexander's exploits. Still, most of the info we'll be sharing does come from the pro-Alexander crowd. So working with that knowledge, let's do our best to get to know Alexander. Just who was this godlike meat sack? Uh, Plutarch, who we'll hear a lot from in this episode, the Greek historian who died in 119 CE, describes Alexander's appearance as, the outward appearance of Alexander is best represented by the statues of him, which Lysippos made, and it was by this artist alone that Alexander himself thought it fit that he should be modeled. For those peculi peculiarities, which many of his successors and friends afterwards tried to imitate, namely the poise of the neck, which was bent slightly to the left, and the melting glance of his eyes, this artist accurately observed. Apelles, however, in painting him as a wielder of the thunderbolt, did not reproduce his complexion, but made it too dark and swarthy. Whereas he was of a fair color, as they say, and his fairness passed into ruddiness on his breast particularly and in his face. Ancient authors recorded that Alexander was so pleased with portraits of himself created by Lysippos that he forbade any other sculptors from crafting his image. I get it. Makes sense, you know? If one sculptor was creating statues of me that were all tall and regal with like washboard abs and broad shoulders and a chiseled jaw and a full head of hair, a thick ass stash or a beard, depending on the time of year, and a big old granite dick pointing towards the heavens, nearly bopping me in the chin, while some other fucker, you know, was painting me all slouched over with a receding hairline, a little baby chin with a fat shame gunt, you know, and little chicken legs topped off by a little sad boy micro peen ween drooping down towards the dirt. I'm going to hire old chisel jaw rock hawk all day long. That other, that other dude can go work on getting gravel ready to pour atop the road I've just traveled upon to return home victorious, fresh from another conquest. Spartans, prepare for glory. Alexander wasn't a Spartan. I know that. I just, I just can't get quotes from Zack Snyder's 2006 movie, 300, out of my head this week. I kept thinking about working on the research. Great movie, by the way, if you like a stylized period piece action flick. Lindsay loved all the muscled six-pack dudes swinging their swords around. She would throw in a Hail Lucifina if she were here. Uh, another description reported that Alexander exhibited heterochromia, a condition in which your eyes are each a different color. One of his eyes was dark, the other was light. Uh, British historian Peter Green provides a, a less than glowing description of Alexander's appearance. Based on a thorough review of statues, coins, and descriptions from some ancient documents, he wrote, Physically, Alexander was not prepossessing. Even by Macedonian standards, he was very short, though stocky and tough. His beard was scanty, and he stood out against his hirsute Macedonian barons by going clean-shaven. His neck was in some way twisted so that he appeared to be gazing upward at an angle. His eyes, one, one blue, one brown, revealed a dewy feminine quality. He had a high complexion and a harsh voice. Okay, not the most flattering description. He used a lot of big academic terms. I had to look up a few to get a handle on some of what he was saying uh, to acknowledge that while the dude had some muscles, he was basically a short, pink-faced, effeminate-looking fellow with a wisp wispy beard if he tried to grow one and an annoying voice. Overall, the Macedonians were a big people, thanks largely to their land's plentiful meat and grain. The men were tall, robust, and dark-skinned. They had thick, cropped hair and wore beards. Most of the men looked like that, not Alexander. 
He was at best average height, perhaps only five foot two. His hair was blonde and tousled. It was said that he wore it long to resemble a lion's mane. Uh, to go back to Alexander biographer Peter Green again, apparently Alex's teeth were sharply pointed, quote, like pegs. <laughs> and his voice, in addition to being harsh, was high pitched. And he was, quote, given to scurrying about in a fast and nervous manner. What the shit? Alexander would for sure have Peter Green killed if he could. Good God, this guy's not painting a picture of a badass warrior king. Apparently, Alexander was a short, pink-faced, effeminate-looking, wispy-bearded dude with an annoying, high-pitched voice with sharp little peg fangs who was fond of scurrying. He sounds like more like some kind of gremlin than a conqueror. It is I, Alexander! Bow before me! Bow lower! Servant! Bring me an apple box to stand on so I can tower above my kneeling, conquered subjects! Uh, no wonder Alex became such a great conqueror. Probably had a huge chip on his shoulder. Bit of a Napoleon complex. Uh, what kind of person? was Alexander. Like many, if not most of us, if not really all of us, almost, almost all of us, uh, he was complicated. Some of his strongest personality traits mirrored those of his parents. His mother, as you'll soon learn, was incredibly ambitious. She instilled a sense in Alexander of being destined for greatness. She got that tiny peg-fanged helium-voiced gremlin of hers to believe in himself, which is probably not an easy task. Uh, Plutarch wrote how Alexander's ambition kept his spirit serious and lofty in advance of his years. Alexander also watched his father, a king who was a giant badass in his own right, lead successful military campaigns year after year. This was highly influential in his development. He watched his dad win over and over again and basically ignore serious battle wounds. His dad was ambitious, successful, tough as shit. Alexander had his work cut out for him if he wanted to one-up his dad, which he did since he was super competitive. Alexander's dad came from a long line of rulers, the Argiad dynasty, a bloodline that went back half a millennia or millennium to the initial founding of the Greek state of Macedonia in roughly 800 BCE. Alexander's lineage reminds me of the ancestry of one of the other great conquerors we've covered, perhaps the greatest, Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan also born to a ruler who was the son of another ruler, uh, noted rulers, uh, not born to a lineage as long and as accomplished as Alexander's, but Genghis's father and grandfather were respected and powerful chiefs. Uh, I don't know what the percentage is, of how many really successful people were raised by other successful people in the same line of work, but it feels like it's gotta be pretty high, which would make sense. You know, I would think it would be a little easier for you to figure out how to become a successful conqueror and leader if your dad was already a successful conqueror and leader, just like it would be a little easier to become successful in real estate or construction or in running a restaurant if you were raised by someone who not only also did those things, but did them very, very well. You're essentially born into an apprenticeship that begins at birth. If you're interested in jumping into the family business, you get to learn by watching as soon as your brain is able to absorb that type of knowledge. Alexander's father helped immensely in regards to pushing Alexander to becoming the greatest conqueror the world has ever seen. As I said, Alex wanted to outdo his father and his dad was a living legend. His dad was the most ambitious and powerful and successful conquering king Macedonia had ever seen prior to his son. Alexander's relationship with his dad was complex. At times, he openly worried that his successful father would leave him no great or brilliant achievement to be displayed to the world. While at other times, he downplayed his father's successes to his buddies and often acted like essentially that his dad was overrated. According to Plutarch, some of Alexander's other traits were a violent temper and a rash, impulsive nature. Also, during the last few years of Alexander's life, he began to exhibit signs of megalomania and paranoia. Not surprised. I don't think a calm, stable person full of a lot of inner peace and a sunny disposition uh, sets out to bring the world to its fucking knees, to bend nations to their will, right? I'd be shocked to hear him described as being a super laid back dude. He just hoped he'd be an okay king, you know, make people happy. Uh, Alexander was also stubborn, didn't respond well to orders from anyone, including his father, the king, but complicated and mercurial as he was, he also could be open to reasoned debate. He had a calmer side, a side that was perceptive, logical, and calculating. He was very intelligent, very well educated. He was also, and I think this may have been the trait that allowed him to be successful in battle more than any other single trait, intensely curious about the world. Hail Nimrod. He had an unquenchable thirst for knowledge. He especially loved philosophy, was an avid reader. And this curiosity combined with a solid natural intellect, it gave him the ability to outsmart his opponents, to understand warfare in an intellectual way. Not all of his opponents were able to grasp. His knowledge of philosophy allowed him to understand his troops and get them to fight harder for him than they might for a lesser leader. He understood human nature and knew how to manipulate it. He also, according to some historians, apparently showed great self-restraint when it came to pleasures of the body. 
although he may have had some issues with alcohol from time to time. I read this as he didn't spend all his time chasing his dick, which aided him in a quest for greatness. And this also must have went a long ways in helping him to achieve greatness. I can't tell you how many uh, other comics I've worked with over the years who complain all the time about their career, not being where they want it to be, and then they just try and get laid all the time instead of actually working on their craft. Right? Not chasing your dick all the time can actually uh, be uh, really good for your ambitious pursuits. Now let's see what kind of world Alexander would operate in. I shouldn't be unfair to the ladies there. Not chasing your push all the time. Also another way to you know focus on your ambitions. Uh, unsurprisingly, why don't people say that more? Ah, oh, look at her just chasing her puss around. Ah, we got to get that term, term out there, that little phrase out there. Well, if you stop chasing your puss around, Becky, maybe you fucking get that raise you wanted. Uh, unsurprisingly, the world looked very different in Alexander's time than it does now. For starters, there weren't nearly as many Starbucks. It was impossible to find a good taco truck or pick up strong Wi-Fi signals so you could stream some sweet shows. On um, 356 BCE, when Alexander was born, Greece was not a unified nation, but rather a loose collection of kingdoms and city-states each of which had their own patron deity, social structure, currency, and government. Macedonia was a kingdom on the northern edge of this collection. The Macedonians spoke Greek, but uh, I don't want to say barely, but they spoke like a hillbilly dialect. They spoke a regional dialect that would have taken a second from someone from like Athens or Sparta un to understand them. I think about it like technically I speak the same language as someone down in Louisiana who has a thick Cajun accent, but it takes me a bit to, to figure out what the fuck they are talking about. And, and I know most people down there on the bayou are uh, not Cajun, by the way. And some people who are Cajun don't have that thick, but you know what I'm talking. If you're from there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When you run into that real thick Cajun, you're like, wait, what? Are, are you sure that's English? And the Macedonians, they were considered Greek-ish by a lot of the other Greeks living in the more cultured city-states like Athens and Thebes. These people considered the Macedonians to be rural hill folk, Greek light, Greek carnies, people on the edge of being barbarians, but not barbarians. They were still considered Greek, bonded by a common tongue and common gods. Crazy, crazy gods. Check out Suck Wins 162 to learn more about Greece's crazy gods. Uh, they were definitely considered Greek by the time Alexander became a ruler because his dad had kicked the shit out of a lot of the other Greek people. Alexander was born into a world full of fighting. The city-states and kingdoms of Greece around him, sometimes they allied with each other, sometimes they fought, they disagreed a lot with each other. Uh, one of the things they didn't disagree on was a dislike of any foreigners who did not speak Greek people referred to as barbarians. For the Greeks, there were the kingdoms of Greece, and then there was the rest of the world, and the rest of the world wasn't shit. They were barbaric. The Greeks had more culture than most of the world at the time. They knew it, and they were pretty arrogant about it. Uh, Greek culture at this time encompassed every aspect of civilization, from literature to philosophy, science, architecture, the arts, mathematics, astronomy, law, medicine, war, and so on. The Greeks were proud of their intellectual achievements, and they looked down on non-Greeks, especially the Persians. They really hated their Persian neighbors who they'd been fighting for centuries. Good old tribalism. We meat sacks still love to root for a team or a race or a nation, love to tell ourselves that we're the best, whether it's true or not. A quality that seems to be hardwired into our human DNA. Uh, Alexander was born at the perfect time for a Macedonian military mastermind to make a name for themselves. The rest of the hoity-toity uppity Greeks down south who had long looked down on the Macedonians weren't doing as well as they had been in centuries past. Their resources had recently been exhausted from the Peloponnesian War, fought from 431 to 404 BCE between Athens and Sparta, and various allies joining in on each side. Most Greek city-states were divided and depleted, and this set the stage for a takeover by Jon Snow in the Night's Watch. Uh, wait, no. Fell into a modern show, show again. It has nothing to do with Alexander. This is not Game of Thrones. Uh, this is the, uh, the Macedonians, and uh, their leaders were gaining strength and consolidating their power. Let's describe how Macedonia fit with the rest of the Greece, uh, with the rest of Greece in a little more detail here. Uh, the Macedonian kingdom had emerged at the dawn of the 7th century BCE, located in the northeast of the Greek peninsula, just north of Greece proper. Uh, the people of Macedon were not thought to have had any culture by the rest of Greece. They were seen as a, a land good mostly for raw materials and for little else. Greece at the time was divided into three broad regions, the coastal plain, open to cultural influences from the wider world, and several Greek-style cities had emerged around the coastline of the Aegean Sea, such as Athens and Rhodes. Inside of, from these was a fertile plain where cities like Thebes and Sparta flourished. Beyond this plain was a mountainous region. Here, Macedonian hill tribes jealously maintained their autonomy. The Macedonians had to constantly deal with aggressive neighbors, especially from the north and the west, from whence the warlike uh, Paeonians, Thracians, Illyrians repeatedly raided them. The Thracians, they had some tough-ass dudes. Spartacus, most famous Roman gladiator of them all, he was a Thracian. Are you not entertained? 
Now I'm referring to a third movie that doesn't have shit to, with, uh, to do with today's tale. Gladiator. God, Russell Crowe was good in that. Uh, 512 BCE, the Macedonians, along with their Thracian neighbors to the north, came under the loose control of the Persian Empire. The domination lasted on and off well into the 5th century when the Greek, 5th century BCE, when the Greek-Persian Wars enabled them to reestablish full independence. And it would lead to Alexander being raised to hate Macedonia's foreign oppressors, the Persians, from an early age, from birth. During the 4th century, uh, Macedonia began to develop from being a comparatively loose confederation of tribes and city-states to being a unified kingdom. And by 400 or so BCE again, 50, 60 years before the birth of Alexander, with Greece on the decline, Macedonia was now poised to be the most powerful kingdom in the ancient world. It was a time of brutal violence, of the strong take what they want and the loser eats shit, even within your own family. Alexander would be born into the perfect kingdom and at the perfect time to give his brilliant military mind a chance to shine. Let's learn more about this perfect place and time and about how his daddy set the stage for his conquering by diving into today's be glad we are no longer living in a world full of so much sword and blood. Time suck. Timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. Three fifty-seven BCE. Alexander's father, King Philip II of Macedonia, and his mother Olympias are married. Olympias would be one of seven of Philip's wives by the time Alexander is born. And Olympias was not born in Macedonia. She was born in the kingdom of uh, Epirus. Gross. I oh, know. And this would uh, cause some problems for Alexander when it came to royal succession. He'd worry several times that his throne would be taken away from him before he had the chance to sit on it. He said gross uh, because she was not a Macedonian. And that meant something to Macedonian people. I, c- I couldn't tell a Macedonian from a Molossian, the tribe based in Epirus, if my life depended on it, uh, but people living in Macedonia could, and they didn't like it. Olympias was a daughter of Neapolitanus, the first king of the Molossians, and Epirus laid to the west of Macedon and slightly south. The Molossian ruling dynasty claimed to be descended from the mythological Molossus, one of the three sons of uh, Neapo- <laughs> Neoptolemus, son of Achilles, who slew Priam at the fall of Troy. Neoptolemus, I think is what I said there. Classic ancient Greek shit, right? Trace your lineage to a hero or a god or both. Alexander would take his name from his Molossian uncle, king of Epirus, during the first few years of his reign and several years before it, Alexander I. Dude's mom may not have been Macedonian, but he did have the blood of kings in his veins on both sides of the family tree. And when he was born, the kingdom of Epirus was nearly as powerful as the kingdom of Macedonia. It wasn't some little shithole. So that's his mom, daughter of the king of the neighboring state and his father, king of the state he was born into. Though history would remember Philip II of Macedon now, or history remembers now uh, Philip is primarily as Alexander's father, he was no slacker himself, was a legend in his own time. He was an accomplished king and military commander who would share his leadership skills with his son. Though it was Alexander who would eventually triple the size of Macedonia, Macedonia's transformation and expansion began with Philip. Philip molded an ineffective, undisciplined army into a formidable, efficient military force eventually subduing the territories around Macedonia as well as subjugating most of Greece. Macedonia occupied an interesting position in the ancient world. Unlike many Greek states, Macedonia, like Epirus, was a monarchy. This made Macedonia seem backwards and primitive to many of the southern democracy-loving Greeks, like the people of Athens. Uh, The royal family of the barbaric land was the Argads. They traced their roots to both the Isle of Argos and Heracles, son of Zeus himself, powerful god of the sky, lightning and thunder, Ruler of all the gods on Mount Olympus, son of the king and queen of the Titans. Uh, born around 383 BCE, Philip was the youngest of three sons of Amentus III. His older brother, uh, per, per, uh, Perducus III, was killed while fighting. That name always throws me. I want to say Perdiccas because I have a junior high brain. I'm like, no, people keep saying Perdiccas. Uh, he was killed while fighting the Illyrians along the northern Macedonian border. Since the oldest Argead brother, Alexander II, was also dead, Philip was made regent for his nephew, Amentus IV, who was the son of Perdiccas uh, III. And then Philip succeeded in taking the kingdom for himself in 359 BCE. Don't worry about those names. They're not that important, but I wanted to throw them out there. Uh, Philip was at one point during his youth held hostage for three years in the Greek city-state of Thebes, where he was exposed to Greek culture, military tactics, formations, and philosophy. Had this not happened, neither he nor his son would likely ever have etched their names into the history books. There he both learned a great deal and also came to resent the arrogance of Greek city-states like Thebes and Athens, 
pushing everyone else around. So his first move when he ascended to the throne at 23 in 359 BCE was to transform the formerly ragtag Macedonian army into a well-oiled fighting machine so he could fuck up those Southerners. His major enemies were the Illyrians, whom he would eventually defeat in 359 BCE, and the Athenians, who had access to gold and silver mines, and who also briefly claimed the Macedonian throne. After his ascension to the throne, while much of Greece to the south was embroiled in a series of civil wars, Philip had time to develop his initial comparatively weak army into a proper fighting force. He more than doubled its size from 10,000 troops to 24,000, grew its cavalry from 600 to 3,500. He created a corps of engineers to develop siege weaponry, namely towers and catapults. He provided uniforms that required an, and required an oath of allegiance to the king in a way that was new in Macedonia. Previously, each soldier might have felt himself allied to his hometown or to his province, but Philip made sure that everyone he recruited into his army felt allegiance only to him. Next, he restructured the traditional Greek phalanx, the traditional ancient Greek fighting unit, right? Group of heavily armed infantry formed in ranks and files close and deep with shields joined, long spears overlapping formations at the time that were eight men deep moving as a unit. And again, I think of the 300. Tonight, we dine in hell. Gerard Butler fucking killed that shit. It's King Leonidas battling the Persians like none had battled them before. Uh, the real Leonidas died about 125 years before Alexander was born. So he uh, surely knew of him in his mythic fight as the leader of the 300 Spartans who died during the Second Persian War, defending a pass from the hated Persian army. Uh, anyways, Philip restructured the traditional Greek phalanx, deciding to provide each individual unit with its own commander, which allowed for better communication. He also changed the principal phalanx weaponry from hoplite spears to the sarissa, an 18 to 20 foot long pike, a weapon that could easily reach over the much shorter spears of the opposition's hoplites. In military lingo, this allowed his men to give extra pokey bad bad hurts to enemy soldiers before taking too many uchi no nos and crying and dying, or something like that. In addition to being provided with sarissas, uh, aka sarissa pikes, soldiers were given new and improved helmets, a redesigned shield, a smaller double edged sword called a xiphos uh, for hand to hand combat. After his reorganization of the army, he remade the capital city of Pella, inviting poets, writers, and philosophers getting some culture up in that shit. Suck it, Athens. We have poets now as well, you snooty fucks. Uh, to assure that his neighbors would not attack him, he invited their sons to Pella. Smart. Who wants to attack the city their son is studying in? That little move, not new to Philip. It was a well-established move in the ancient world, right? You have sons would travel to other countries, ostensibly to be, quote, educated, but also to serve as hostages to maintain peaceful relations between countries. Uh, so, of course, uh, Philip knew about this. It had happened to him when he was younger. Uh, in 357 BCE, Philip captured the Athenian colony at uh, uh, Amphipolis, acquiring its gold and silver mines. He returned the mines to the city-state temporarily, only to recapture them later. From there, Philip seized the northern Greek cities of Poti Pot <laughs> Potidia and Pydna in 356 BCE. In 352 BCE, the Macedonian army paired up with the Thessalian cavalry to crush the Phocians and their commander Onomarchus at the Battle of Crocus Field. The Phocians were allies of Sparta and Athens. Athens waged a war constantly against Macedonia until 346 BCE as well, probably pissed off about those mines. This constant warfare weakened the southern Greek city-states, fighting too many people too often. And Philip was able to capture the cities of Cronides in 355 BCE, which he renamed Philippi, uh, Methone in 354 BCE, which he razed to the ground, and Olynthus in 348 BCE. He expanded Macedonia's hold on Greece to a level never before seen, a project his son would continue beyond anyone's wildest dreams. Uh, Philip didn't escape these battles without some serious personal scars, lost one of his eyes, broke a shoulder that never fully healed right, also ended up with a crippled leg before he finally died. And think about how, how much injury sucked back then. Right? You probably got injured way more often because there was so much casual violence back then. Uh, and if you're actually fighting in battle, if you're a soldier, it's hand-to-hand -hand combat and you're definitely picking up wounds. And there are no surgeons to fix you. No op opioids to number the pain. No physical therapists to give you a little rehab. No chiropractors. No, I mean, no yoga instructors. I mean, there were ancient Greek surgeons, right? The famous Greek doctor, uh, Hippocrates, lived at that time, uh, you know, roughly at the same time as Philip. But while they could set like a basic broken bone, uh, they had a very crude understanding of anatomy compared to today. You, you weren't going to get any pins inserted for a complex fracture. You weren't getting antibiotics when shit got infected. It's terrible. 
Uh, during his conquest of Greece, despite his body getting all fucked up, Philip found the time to get married seven times. The most famous of these marriages was to Olympias, who would become Alexander's mother. We met her briefly. While historians disagree on how Philip and Olympias met, the most widely accepted story is that they met on uh, Samothrace, a beautiful and mountainous island in the Aegean Sea between Macedonia and Troy. I keep uh, I kept getting distracted doing the research and checking out current Greek islands, cities, and towns. My God, is that a beautiful country? Like that island of Samothrace, uh, gorgeous. Uh, when Philip saw the young Olympias, a red-haired woman with intoxicating beauty and a fiery temper, hail Lucifina, it was lust, I mean love, at first sight. The historian Plutarch would write about the encounter. After Philip has been initiated on Samothrace along with Olympias, he fell passionately in love with her, and although he was only a young adult and she was an orphan, he went right ahead and betrothed himself to her. Uh, she wasn't some like child orphan, by the way. Uh, she was an adult, but you know, her dad had died and her mom had died. It wasn't uncommon for kings to marry more than once, especially because many of the marriages were for alliances. Olympias was Philip's second wife. At the time of their marriage, Olympias was about 18, Philip uh, about 28. He still had both eyes, decent shoulder, didn't drag one of his legs yet. So she's probably pretty pumped. Uh, the myth surrounding Alexander the Great began before his birth with the night before his parents' wedding. Plutarch wrote, on the night before they were to be locked into the bridal chamber together, the bride had a dream in which following a clap of thunder, her womb was struck by a thunderbolt. This started a vigorous fire which then burst into flames and spread all over the place before dying down. Meanwhile, Philip had a dream that night where he was pressing a seal on his wife's to uh, womb and that the emblem on the seal was the figure of a lion. These two dreams, they believe, signified that their son would become a mighty warrior. And I have to wonder, did they actually have those fucking dreams? Or did they make that shit up? Did they come up with that story to make people think that their son was just, you know, this mighty as shit. Uh, their marriage wasn't without his struggles, which is not surprising since he was already married. And uh, when he married her, he would then get married, you know, five more times after her, guessing Lindsay would be a little annoyed with me if I brought a wife to the table and then just kept getting more wives. Guessing. Uh, Philip, it appeared, ended up getting creeped out by his young wife, who was a devotee to the cult of Dionysus, god of wine, fertility, and drama. He's rumored to have stopped visiting her bedchamber after he stumbled into her room one night and claims he saw Olympias, quote, sleeping with snakes. As in literally having snakes in the bed, possibly having sex with them somehow. Not sure this happened. Gonna say didn't happen. Seems like some myth building. Part of Alexander's legend is that he uh, was the son of Zeus. That would become his legend. And what did Zeus like to do? As we learned in the Greek gods suck, he liked to take the form of various animals. And then in that animal form, he liked to have sex with human women and impregnate them which seems really fucking creepy and unnecessary. Seems like he could have just taken the form of a regular dude, just a handsome dude, not a snake. But nope, maybe he was super kinky. Maybe he just wanted to get some of that snake on lady action. How does that work anyway? I, I can't recall uh, prior to what I'm about to say, ever seen a snake's dick. <laughs> I Googled snake dick because I was like, hey, do snakes even have dicks? And, uh, and it led to me finding out that snakes do have dick. They have two dicks. They have two penises called hemipenes. Super creepy looking. Uh, the little weens look even more disturbing than you would probably imagine. And then uh, when I was looking at the image, you know, kind of page of little snake dicks, there was also a picture of a dude sticking his human ween directly in front of what looks like a large bow constrictor's head, which seems like a terrible idea. Maybe not the best way to impress your friends. Maybe, maybe not the best kink to have. Seems dangerous. And I'm, and I'm done now with all this snake dick talk. I uh, was just trying to say, I think the story of Olympia sleeping with snakes was part of the legend building surrounding Alexander being the son of Zeus. Highly doubt it happened. Uh, Olympias gave birth to her snake god future king baby, Alexander, on July 20th or 21st, 356 BCE. His proper name was Alexander III of Macedon. Why the third? Because he had two uncles named Alexander. His mom's bro, Alexander I, and his dad's bro, Alexander II. His family went real heavy on the name Alexander. Uh, as custom for someone who would go down as a hero in the ancient world, his birth was heralded by a bunch of heavenly signs. At the time of Alexander's birth, Philip was away in battle at uh, Patidia. Just after he took the city, he received three messages. The first, that Parmenio, his general, had defeated the Illyrians in a great battle. Two, his racehorse had won at the Olympic Games. And three, his wife had given birth to Alexander. And Philip interpreted all this happening at the same time as an obvious omen that meant his son would clearly become an invincible conqueror. I get it. My son Kyler is also destined for greatness. Lot of omens. On January 9th, 2006, date of his birth, skateboard legend Tony Hawk got married in Fiji. <laughs> and not done. 
Bald eagle flew high that day in the air and screeched. And still not done, there were some wolves somewhere howling and stuff. So pretty fucking cool. And when my daughter Monroe was born on January 12, 2008, Johnny Grant, former honorary mayor, mayor of Hollywood, showbiz, uh, he died. So how can that be a coincidence? And I'm uh, pretty sure Bald Eagle screeched again and some wolves were around, you know, somewhere. You get it. You know, coincidence <laughs> or symbols of destinies of great import. Um, there were other great signs and wonders associated with Alexander's birth, including a bright star gleaming over Macedonia the night, uh, that night and miraculous destruction of the temple of Artemis at uh, Ephesus. According to Plutarch, all the Eastern soothsayers who happened to be at Ephesus looked at the ruin of the temple, ran around town, beating their faces, literally beating them, crying that the day had brought forth something that would be fatal and destructive to all of Asia. I'm going to say bullshit, uh, but okay, that was written. Pretty cool. Uh, I also noticed that Plutarch didn't say anything about eagles or wolves, so yeah, maybe my stuff's cooler. Now, uh, after Alexander's arrival, his mother's primary objective in life was to make him king. That's not myth making. That's that's truth there. Olympias doted on young Alexander, telling him constantly that he had a noble lineage, that he was descended from Achilles. He was made to think Achilles was one of his ancestors. And maybe sometimes she took him aside and whispered in his ear stuff like, you're real down at Zeus. I said, don't tell your friends. Yeah. Zeus, he snake fucked me. He's not, he snake fucked me. And that's how you got here. Just keep quiet about it. Uh, the Zeus stuff probably added years after his death. Um, most of it. He did, towards the end of his life, think he was descended from Zeus. Uh, his dad did claim descent from Achilles, was likely told uh, that also is a tall tale. The story, these stories had a powerful effect on young, young Alexander. He started to believe that he was descended from heroes, from gods. I wonder if it's too late to tell my kids that Batman is their real dad. Uh, Alexander believed these stories so much he carried Homer's Iliad around uh, wherever he went, inspired by tales of mythic bravery. And on a serious note, in addition to his father setting the stage for future conquering by being a great conqueror himself, his mother also played a huge role in who he would become by constantly telling him he was incredible, that the blood of heroes flowed through his veins, the blood of gods. He was destined for greatness. Not a terrible parenting model here. You know, this is maybe an exaggerated version of this, but give, so, give those kids some confidence, right? If you want your kids to accomplish great things, make them believe they are destined or at least worthy of greatness. As far as Alexander's childhood, we don't know a lot of specific details and important dates, not a lot of recorded information about his youth, aside from several tales of precociousness. Uh, he allegedly interviewed visiting dignitaries one time about the boundaries and strengths of Persia when he was just seven years old. Uh, during his childhood, he did become friends with Cassander, who would grow up to marry Alexander's half-sister and eventually rule the kingdom Alexander created. He was also friends with Ptolemy, ancestor of Cleopatra, founder of the Ptolemaic dynasty, last great dynasty of Egypt. So much incest, if you recall that suck in that dynasty. Uh, he's friends with ah, Hephaestion, described by historians as by far the dearest of all of the king's friends. He had been brought up with Alexander and shared all of his secrets. And these men would become generals in Alexander's army. So pretty cool. Kicking ass and conquering the world with your childhood buddies. Uh, Callisthenes, Kalis another friend, was Aristotle's great nephew and came to the Macedonian court with, a, the, with the philosopher, and he would become Alexander's official historian as he set about conquering Asia. He wrote an account of Alexander's expedition up to the time of his own execution. Sadly, that work and all of his other works have perished. His account of Alexander's expedition was preserved long enough to be mined as a direct or indirect source for some of the other ancient historical uh, writers I mentioned earlier. And he would be executed for plotting to have his old buddy Alexander assassinated. So maybe not as good of a friend as the other guys. Maybe more of a frenemy. Alexander, like these other young Greek dudes, was taught to fight and ride. Even got some experience enduring hardships like forced march marches in his childhood to toughen him up. His dad, his dad hired Lysimachus, one of his generals and a man who would become a Thracian king, to teach Alexander reading, writing, and the lyre. Uh, even though most of his life was spent on military endeavors, he also uh, grew to have a deep love of writing and music, had a variety of amazing tutors. Alexander was raised from birth as the heir to his father's throne. Uh, but another possible heir, a younger half-brother named Philip, uh, did show up. Philip Jr.'s mom was a commoner, and it's doubtful he would have uh, ever become king. But he did have a claim to the throne, or did until Alexander's mommy took care of him. Some evidence exists that Olympias poisoned this kid with a drug that eventually, quote, addled his wits. So he would never be a threat to Alexander becoming king. According to Plutarch, Philip Jr.'s mind became ruined when he was poisoned by Olympias. Thanks, Mom. Thanks for giving my half-brother brain damage so I don't have to worry about him challenging my throne. That's 
crazy world back then. Uh, even with Philip Jr. gone, Olympias didn't still feel 100% secure in her son's claim for the crown. Because she was from neighboring Epirus, the king was pressured to marry a true Macedonian and provide the country with a more pure-blooded heir. This will cause a big stir in Greek politics down the line. Sometime in 346 BC, at the age of 9 or 10, Alexander would get a horse that, like him, would become famous. Bucephalus, one of the most famous horses in history. Not a lot of famous horses. Other than old Bucephalus, I can only think of Seabiscuit and Mr. Ed. Bucephalus would go down in history because the story of their first encounter would become legendary. Initially, Bucephalus was brought to Macedon and presented to King Philip. The horse was expensive and stood taller than a normal Macedonian horse and looked like a prized stallion, but it appeared to be too wild to ride. Bucephalus reared up against anyone who tried to ride him, so Philip ordered that the horse be sent away. And according to either Plutarch or maybe just according to me, Philip said, no, thank you. I'm a king, not a fucking rodeo clown, you ass hat. Go turn that bucket and stomp an asshole into some glue. Uh, then as the attendants tried to lead Bucephalus away, Alexander rose from his seat, shouting that the attendants were just spineless, that he could tame this horse. According to Plutarch, not according to me, this is real, Alexander exclaimed, what an excellent horse do they lose for want of address and boldness to manage him. And his father, Philip, replied, do you reproach those who are older than yourself as if you were better able to manage him than they? Alexander then declared that he'd pay for the horse if he was unable to tame him. And then amid wild laughter, Alexander approached the horse calmly. He had realized something the others hadn't, that the horse was simply too hot-blooded too horny to ride. Easy, Satsparilla. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Easy, easy. So with a gentle hand, he grabbed the horse's supple penis and he began to truly tame a wild stallion the only way he knew how, by firmly, steadily, rhythmically jerking it off while also making solid intents and most importantly, dominating eye contact. Wait, that's insane. Uh, that never happened. No, he realized the horse was afraid of his own shadow. That's right. Okay. <laughs> uh, turning Bucephalus toward the sun so his shadow was behind him, Alexander took the reins and mounted him. The laughter of the crowd turned to cheers as Alexander comfortably rode off. When Alexander returned to the arena with Bucephalus and dismounted, Philip said, Oh, my son, look thee out a kingdom equal to and worthy of thyself, for Macedonia is too little for thee. And again, did that really happen? I don't know. Maybe more legend building. Yeah, maybe it did. Uh, it does appear to be true that Bucephalus and Alexander did become inseparable. They would ride into every battle from the conquest of the Greek city-states in Thebes through the Battle of Gagamila in Assyria and on into India. Around 343 BCE, Philip hired a tutor for Alexander, the philosopher Aristotle. I've heard of him. And he, uh, he'd hold this post for seven years. Aristotle's teachings would have a large impact on Alexander, who would spread Aristotle's philosophy uh, around the known world as he conquered new lands. Let's talk about Aristotle for a second. Ancient dude deserving of a suck of his own someday. Aristotle was one of the founders of Western philosophy along with Socrates and Plato. Plato was Aristotle's mentor. Socrates was Plato's mentor. Each one recording and reconsidering the teachings of the one who came before him. Aristotle was born in 384 BCE in Stagira, Greece, on the border of Macedonia, making him around 40 at the time he took on his famous student. Aristotle's father was the physician to the Macedonian king, but he died when Aristotle was just 10 years old and Aristotle was sent to Athens to study at Plato's academy. It appears Aristotle thought he would take over the academy after Plato's death. And then when the position was given to Plato's nephew, Aristotle was like, well, fuck it then. He left Athens to conduct experiments and study on his own in the islands of the Greek archipelago. Now, he was a philosopher. He also pioneered system, uh, systematic uh, scientific examination, literally every area of human knowledge from biology and medicine to arts and cultures and was known as the man who knew everything. Then later simply as the philosopher. How cool is that? This dude was essentially seen by his peers as the smartest man alive. Pretty impressive title. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm not even considered the smartest person in my own house or possibly even in the top three. There's only four of us. Maybe not even the top four. Uh, well, wait a minute. That's bad math. I have to be in the top four because I'm alive. And I live there. I'm definitely smarter than Penny Pooper and Ginger Bell. Doodles can't even speak English. <laughs> I can. Not always well, but, you know, I get by. Uh, Aristotle, who held a low opinion of non-Greek barbarians generally and Persians specifically, encouraged Alexander's conquest of their empires. And with most, if not all Greeks, Aristotle would have been brought up hearing stories of the Battle of Marathon of 490 BCE, the Persian invasion of 480 BCE, the Greek triumph over the Persian forces at Salamis, and uh, oh my, Plataea. There we go. 
Hatred of the Persians was baked deeply into Greek culture as the two had been rivals for centuries. Rather than discourage him from er warfare, Aristotle gave Alexander philosophical justification for it. So many things had to happen for this guy to become the world's greatest military conqueror. His dad was a great conqueror, right? He was born into the lineage of kings. His mother constantly told him he was destined for amazing things. He was taught by possibly the greatest mind the world had ever known up until that point. Aristotle was philosophically pro-war on the grounds that it provided opportunity for greatness and the application of one's personal excellence to difficult practical situations. Aristotle believed that the final purpose for human existence was happiness and that this happiness could be realized by maintaining a virtuous life. By associating with virtuous comrades who sought the same ends, the soul was enriched and one's excellence sharpened and honed. And warfare provided many opportunities for an individual to expand upon and prove not only self-worth, but greatness. Uh, okay, interesting way to look at that. Uh, to enrich yourself by literally butchering others. Not, uh, not so enriching for those people, but whatever. Uh, Aristotle had such a profound impact on Alexander that Alexander would carry Aristotle's works with him on his campaigns and introduce his philosophy to the East when Alexander conquered the Persian Empire. Through Alexander, Aristotle's works were spread through the known world of the time, influencing other philosophies and, according to many historians, providing a foundation for the development of Jewish, Christian, and Muslim ideology and theology. A young Alexander was a prince with a damn good teacher, surrounded by the sons of other powerful men as friends and coddled by an insanely supportive mom, willing to hurt other kids to keep his path to the throne clear. But as a teen, he still wasn't fully embraced by his own countrymen who saw him as a product of Olympias in her home country, again, of Epirus, still considered by many to be a foreigner and not a true Macedonian. Why do people get weird about shit like that? Silly, mindless tribalism. Why do some people seem to care more about where someone is born, who their parents are, than the strength of their character? Reminds me of uh, xenophobic people today and, I don't know, just people just, just weird and territorial, territorial, you know? So-and-so is not a true blank or a real blank. Like me, I was born and raised in blank. Uh, I grew up in a town where a lot of people have uh, and had this attitude. I was and will always be considered a local by some because I was born in Riggins. My family goes several generations deep in Riggins on my mom's side. Three generations on my dad's side at least spent some time in Riggins. Graduated high school there. And I love Riggins. And I go there many times a year, every year to visit family. But always have thought it's weird how someone else could move there when they're, say, 25, live there a lot longer than I ever did, uh, and still be considered an outsider, you know, because they didn't go to school there. They weren't born there. I don't know. The whole born and raised crowd. If that's your biggest badge of honor, it might be time to reevaluate your life. Uh, Alexander had to deal with this shit and it helped motivate him to wage more war than he may have other otherwise waged. He felt he had to remove any doubt that he wasn't worthy of his father's crown and he did that by becoming the best in what his countrymen valued the most, war. When Alexander was only 16 in 340 BCE, Philip appointed him as regent of the kingdom while Philip embarked on a foreign campaign. During his short time in charge while one-eyed king daddy was away getting some new battle scars, Alexander successfully quelled a Thracian rebellion in one of Macedonia's northern territories. And after his first military victory, he founded his first city, calling it Alexandropolis. No ego there. The location of this city, likely a small city unknown, thought to, uh, that a later Thracian raid may have wiped it from the map. Uh, when Philip returned home and learned of his young son's achievement, he was impressed. He was proud. From this point on, Papa Phil brought Alexander along on other important military expeditions. Alexander's first great military success, fighting alongside dad, came at the Battle of Chaeronea in August of 338, 338 BCE. Here in this ancient city in eastern Greece, in uh, Boeotia, northwest of Athens, the Athenians, Thebans, and a small number of their allies positioned themselves to defend a Macedonian attack. The Athenians, with 10,000 infantry, 600 cavalry, uh, yeah, cavalry were on their left. Their allies were in the center and the Thebans with 800 cavalry and 12,000 infantry, including 300 members of the sacred band waited on the far right. Who was a sacred band? You may wonder. I wondered that the sacred band was a 150 pairs of male lovers chosen for being elite fighters. They were legendary warriors who preferred a glorious death to a dishonorable defeated life. And I guess there was an advantage these guys had where they weren't worried about heading home to their loved ones because they were fighting with their loved ones. They were fighting to save their loved one's life because the loved one was right beside him. Uh, across from Athenians were the Macedonians with 30,000 infantry, 3,000 cavalry, over 55,000 dudes with pikes and swords and horses getting ready to slash each other apart. The scale of these ancient hand-to-hand -hand battles always blows my mind. Face-to-face -face fighting. No mention of archers in this battle. The Greeks did employ archers in battles around this time. Uh, you know, uh, Alexander would employ archers in some battles, but they, but they never favored them, never leaned on them. 
right? The, the Most of the fighting was done by the infantry, the hoplites, the phalanx. What a rough way to fight, staring your enemy in the eye with nothing but something sharp in your hand to kill them with. Facing the opposing army, Philip was off to the right. Facing the Thebans was his 18-year-old son, Alexander. These leaders fought alongside with their men. They didn't stand back and just like direct traffic from the hill. They were fighting themselves. Uh, at around sunrise, the two armies ready themselves for battle. Philip ordered Alexander to lead one wing while Philip himself led the other. The battle was fierce and bloody and victory was uncertain until Alexander was the first to break through the enemy's front lines. Alexander's men followed, leaving dozens of slain men in their wake until the opposing side had to give up their ground and retreat. At only 18, Alexander helped turn the tide of battle in the decisive uh, Macedonian victory. After this fateful battle, the rest of the Greeks were no longer uh, a military or political threat to the Macedonians. After decades of fighting with the Greeks, Philip could now turn his military ambitions away from Greece and eastward to Persia, where his son would soon make his name. In 337 BCE, Attalus, a close friend and commander of the Macedonian army, convinced Alexander's father, Philip II, to marry his niece, Cleopatra uh, Eurydice, Eurydi yeah, Eurydice, a woman from Macedonia to provide a more suitable heir to the Macedonian throne. At this wedding, Alexander watched the festivities with, uh, you know, a fair amount of anger. He wasn't pumped about someone trying to openly replace him. Alexander started, especially after he's kicking some ass in some battles, uh, Alexander started to complain loudly at the wedding to the point that his dad, Philip, actually stood up and went to attack him, drawing his sword. Luckily for both of them, his dad, Philip, was too drunk to fight and the two made it through the wedding unscathed, right? And you thought you'd seen some fucking dramatic weddings. These guys almost got in a fucking sword fight. Uh, after the wedding, Alexander took his mom, Olympias, back to her home of Epirus, and then he went uh, and stayed among the Illyrians himself. After Philip arranged a reconciliation through an envoy, uh, demarcates of Corinth, Alexander and Olympias uh, were allowed to return to Pella. Because of this father-son blowout, Philip ended up exiling many of Alexander's friends, thinking they were bad influences. But they'd convinced Alexander to speak out against his dad. He wasn't having it. Alexander's best friend, uh, Hephaestion, was one of the few who was spared. And let's hear a little more about Hephaestion, this fella. Uh, you know, he has a big role in today's episode. Hephaestion, son of Amyntas, was raised in the Macedonian capital of Pella and, according to most sources, was born in 356 BCE. Same year as Alexander. He was from an aristocratic family and, like Alexander, took lessons from Aristotle. Hephaestion's friendship with Alexander would eventually enable him to be appointed second in command. Wasn't a fighter himself, but did demonstrate a talent for battlefield organization. Alexander would leave much of the campaign's logistics to Hephaestion and the, the supply, the transportation of equipment, bridge building, establishment and planning of new settlements. Another of Alexander's officers, Craterus, uh, resented how close Hephaestion was to Alexander, and the two had to be separated on more than one occasion. At one point in India, they drew sword and were about to fight when Alexander intervened, reprimanding them both. Later, Plutarch said the king brought the two together, made them friends, but gave each a warning that he would kill them if they were found to be quarreling again. That's a, that's a stern warning. That's not like, a, come, on, come on, you guys, knock it off. You don't get, you know, second portion of dinner tonight. No, it's more like, knock it off, you guys. I'll, I'll fucking kill you. For real. Now, for real. One more time. I'll fucking kill you. In the end, Craters would return to Macedonia, eventually dying in 321 BCE during the successor wars after Alexander's death. Some historians believe that the relationship between Alexander and Hephaestion was more romantic than platonic. While it's impossible to put modern terms for sexuality like gay or homosexual onto historical figures who lived at a time with much more different conceptions of gender and, gender and sexuality, it's interesting to note that Early in Alexander's life, Philip and Olympias worried about their son's apparent lack of heterosexual interests. The Greek scholar uh, Theophrastus says that he, they feared that Alexander might be turning into a Guinness or a womanish man. Uh, Olympias even went so far as to procure a Thessalian courtesan named Calexina to help develop Alexander's manly nature. This effort was apparently unsuccessful. Plutarch wrote that Alexander did not know any woman before he married other than Barsine, a Persian noblewoman with whom Alexander is rumored to have had an affair with in 333 BCE when he was 23. So it wasn't a big ladies' man and possibly not interested in ladies at all other than for political reasons. Uh, we don't know for sure if the two were lovers, but throughout his life, Hephaestion remained close to Alexander, serving both as a valuable advisor and a friend. And his talent for logistics would be one of the factors that would enable Alexander to conquer the Persian Empire. Just another piece of the puzzle that had to go right for him to accomplish what he accomplished. Uh, back now to 335 BCE. That year, at the wedding banquet of Olympias' brother Alexander, who was marrying Olympias' daughter, Cleopatra, Philip was assassinated by one of his personal bodyguards, the disgruntled uh, Pausanias, 
who had been rebuked by Philip after he'd asked for retribution against Attalus, dude who had Philip marry his sister so he could kick Alexander out of the line for the throne. Fucking Attalus! Always causing problems! Typical Attalus. Uh, Pisanius tried to flee but was killed. Suspicion immediately fell on Olympias, who some believed had encouraged Pisanius to seek revenge and kill Philip. There was even reason to believe that she had provided the horses for Pisanius' escape. Despite this suspicion, Alexander ascended to the throne anyway. Immediately afterward, his mom, Olympias, uh, had his had her former husband's uh, new wife, Cleopatra, killed and uh, had a child she'd had with Philip also killed. She wasn't going to fuck around and let some kid live who could someday take her son's power and with it, her power. Uh, she was finally the king's mother and no one else could claim the Macedonian throne. Crazy how often this sort of shit happened in ancient times. First prize in the Game of Thrones is the crown. Second prize is death. Imagine this type of thing in modern terms, <laughs> right? We have a real heated presidential election coming up in America. No matter who wins, no matter who loses, there's going to be a lot of tears. So many people believe that the fate of the country rests with the outcome that the stakes could not be higher. Oh, oh they could be a lot higher. They could be way fucking higher. Imagine if whoever lost was literally executed. <laughs> and many of their most trusted advisors, many of the people who were their you know, loudest public supporters also executed, their children executed, their wives executed. That is what life was like often in ancient times. This is so random, but I think about all the Karens alive right now, right? Male and female Karens, just, just people who are outraged all the time. People who complain all the time, just, oh my God, how could this be happening? People who go uh, to ask to speak to the manager real quick. People who, uh, you know, just uh, can't let uh, a terrible customer service interaction go. It reduces them to tears. Imagine like Karens living in ancient Greece, dealing with this, this level of atrocity. Are you serious? Are you serious? Cleopatra was killed and her child was killed? Fucking what? Because they were Philip's wife and child? Oh my God. That is not okay. I am not going to stand by and act like all this is okay. It's not okay, Becky. Excuse me, Mr. Hoplite bodyguard or whatever, dude. I'd like to speak to your king like right fucking now. He is going to get an earful. Hey, get your fucking hands off of me. What are you doing with that sword? Are you crazy? Ow. That's really sharp, you asshole. I demand to speak with your general. Ow! And your king. Stop! You're going to pay for this. I will have you fire. Oh my God, I'm bleeding so much. Who's going to pay to replace this dress? Are you fucking serious? <laughs> That's so entertaining to me. Just to think about some easily outraged person getting thrown back into ancient times. Oh, man. <laughs> my frustration and heightened emotional, and, and, uh, you know, with the heightened emotional and divisive climate of 2020, it really kind of eases up when I think about things like that. It really kind of puts it all into a nice historical perspective. Now let's check out what Alexander unleashed looked like. So now after his dad's dead, after Philip's death, several towns and territories under Macedonian control try to break free. While young Alexander is busy whipping the northern kingdoms of Thrace and Illyria back into line, the Greek leaders of Thebes hear a rumor that Alexander might have been killed in battle. They decide that it's their time to regain their independence from Macedonia. The Assembly of Thebes appeals to a variety of other Greek city-states for help. They get sympathy and understanding, but not much actual help. Uh, Athens does send some weapons to Thebes, uh, maybe with a little best of luck kind of note. I hope he's dead too, uh, but that's it. Uh, when Alexander, who is not dead, learns of this, he marches into Thebes from Thrace with his army. Alexander has 30,000 infantry, 3,000 horsemen with him. Thebes only manages to assemble about 7,000 hoplites and about 1,000 horsemen. So <laughs> advantage, Alexander. Uh, the strength of Alexander's army approaches the number of the entire population of the residents of Thebes. Alexander suggests that Thebes turn over the two main instigators of the rebellion to him and he'll leave everyone else alone. No, he just wants to have a calm and reasonable discussion with these two guys. Ask them politely not to do that again, or maybe cut their heads off, maybe have them torn limb from limb, you know, by horses or something. Uh, if Thebes gives him these two men, though, no more harm to the city will come. And the inhabitants of the Thebes, they really fuck things up. They decide to resist uh, and they attack the Mac uh, Macedonians who beat them back easily. Then three days after the initial attack, some soldiers from the phalanx of one of Alexander's generals, uh, Perducus, breaks into the palisade on the south side of Thebes before another skirmish between the two armies is expected to start, catching them off guard. The Thebans rush to defend the walls and close the gate, but they're, you know, too late. And they can't do so before the entire Macedonian army enters the city. When this happens, most of the Theban detachments, uh, most of their army, they're located outside the city. Not good. So now there's only defenseless civilians inside. And Macedonian soldiers run through the streets of Thebes, just causing fucking mayhem. Uh, the Theban hoplites now, uh, you know, have no city to defend. Those who don't flee are going to be killed in the chaos that the city's capture. 
Alexander decides he's going to, you know, uh, send the rest of the cities of Greece a message via Thebes. Anyone who crosses Macedonia will not only be defeated, but their people will be fucking obliterated. Very Genghis Khan of him, or I guess since Genghis came later, well over a millennium later. In fact, it would be very Alexander of Genghis to do the same to many of the cities he would sack. In Thebes, Alexander's army kills 6,000 citizens, captures 30,000 more before burning the city to the ground. That is a message. Anyone who crosses Macedonia will be obliterated. According to the Greek historian Diodorus of Sicily, all the city was pillaged. Elsewhere, boys and girls were dragged into captivity as they wailed piteously the names of their mothers. In the end, when night finally intervened, the houses had been plundered and children and women and aged persons who had fled into the temples were torn from sanctuary and subjected to outrage without limit. Ugh. What would time traveling Karen think? Are you fucking serious? Oh my God. That is like, what? No limit to the outrage that's happening right now? Becky, look at this. Look what's happening to the children. Look what these soldiers are doing to these women. Oh my God. No, Becky, I will not get in my car and go home and have a vodka soda. I'm going to find out who thinks they're in fucking charge of this shit show. I'll have their job by, hey, what do you, get your hands off me. Put that sword, I'll ruin your life. Uh, only 500 Macedonian soldiers will be killed in all this fighting. Dominant victory for Alexander. And not the last time Alexander would use cruel tactics to send a message to those who opposed him. With his hold over Greece now temporarily secure, Alexander begins assembling a multicultural Greek army for a new purpose, to invade Asia, to attack the Persians he'd been raised to hate. Uh, though the Greeks and Macedonians were themselves fragmented culturally, they could all get behind fucking up some Persians. Before crossing the Hellespont, a strait in Turkey that marks the boundary between Europe and Asia, Alexander decided to first visit the Oracle at Delphi. And when I first heard this, I thought, how weird to visit an Oracle, right? It might be Delphi. It's one of the few words I didn't put a pronunciation guide for. I thought I had it, but now I question it. Uh, but I thought, how weird though, right? To have him visit an Oracle, to make an important decision. Then I remembered how many palm readers are still around today, right? And how many people visit, you know, minister, rabbi, imam, priest, et cetera, to get spiritual advice. And I thought, oh, okay, it's the same shit. Uh, in some ways, we've changed so much over the last few millennia. In other ways, nah, not so much. Unfortunately, the oracle is closed. And on the day, uh, deliveries from the oracle are forbidden, even for Alexander. Uh, he calls for the oracle priestess, uh, Pythia, to appear, but she refuses. because She doesn't understand who the fuck she's talking to. Uh, Alexander drags her out to the temple, <laughs> lets her choose to either answer his questions or, you know, die. So she chooses to talk. Uh, he wants to know, what did the gods say about his expedition to Asia? Realizing any bad news would probably get her killed, I have to imagine. She, of course, tells him that he will be invincible. I mean, what else is she supposed to say in that situation? I wouldn't try it, Alex. You're too short. Uh, your face is too pink and womanly. Uh, your voice is too high for anyone really uh, abroad to take you seriously. Just, <laughs> just go home, silly little goose. Uh, from Delphi, Alex crosses the Hellespont to Asia Minor, where uh, before touching Asian soil, he throws a spear into the ground claiming Asia as a reward to him from the gods. Fuck yeah. That's some boss ass shit. Throwing a spear into the ground to claim a continent. That's pretty sick. I've never done anything remotely that cool in my life. I wish I could pull off something like that now. Just claim my neighbor's yard by throwing a big ass war spear in the lawn. Time to move, Jim. Nothing personal, dude. It's just a conquest thing. Which yours is now mine, Jim. Hey, what are you doing? Hey, hey, don't go back in your garage and start working on your boat again and ignore me. Y come on, you see the spear. Uh, Alexander then chose to visit the tomb of his hero and supposed ancestor Achilles at Troy, a small village at the time. With him at Troy, of course, is uh, Hephaestion, uh, who lay a wreath at the tomb of Achilles' friend Patroclus, symbolically comparing Alexander and Hephaestion's friendship to a relationship to Achilles and uh, Patroclus, I think is how you say it. Apparently, uh, a lot of the other officers didn't care for this. They were jealous, which I get. You know, these guys were likely lovers in addition to friends. Hard for, you know, uh, uh, some other general to compete for Alexander's attention when he's, you know, fucking one of the other generals. It's going to be tough to overcome. Uh, Alexander's overly protective mother apparently also resented this relationship. Of course she did. She killed for her baby boy. And if anyone's going to fuck her baby boy, it's going to be her. Wait, what? I don't think it was that kind of jealous. I don't think. As we learned long ago in the Cleopatra suck about the Greek Ptolemies, they did love the, some incest. So who knows? Uh, when Alexander took off on his nearly decade-long military campaign, a man named Anti Antipater was named Regent of Macedon and would rule in his place. Uh, he would rule with Alex's mom, breathing down his neck and up his ass, but he would rule in uh, Alexander's place. 
334 BCE, Alexander sets his sights on conquering the important city of Sardis and Lydia, which now lies in modern-day western Turkey. He leads his army up towards the gates of the citadel, surveys the triple walls, steep slopes that surround the city. He then gives praise to Zeus, decides to create a shrine for the Greek god. Before he can find a site for the shrine, a sudden summer thunderstorm appears overhead. The storm lashes the city with rain. A thunderbolt strikes the ground near the palace of the Lydian kings. And Alexander believes this uh, meant that Zeus himself had chosen this site for his shrine. And he orders the shrine to be built on that spot. And then he's able to take the city without bloodshed. The city surrenders, seeing the size of his army. And he attributes this all to Zeus. Oh, Papa Snake gave him this victory. Hail Papa Snake! Alexander then decides to stay in Sardis for a few days while he makes arrangements to take Lydia into the rapidly growing Macedonian Empire. He didn't want to take uh, the existing Persian administrative system and incorporate it into Macedon. So instead of appointing a uh, satrap, aka a governor, to have powers over the civil, judicial, and military administrations, uh, Alexander appoints three different men for these tasks, increasing Macedonia's presence in the daily lives of Lyrians. This has the double effect of not only give, uh, giving one Macedonian general too much power, uh, so they'd be less likely to rebel against him as well. He limits his own general's power and Lyrian's autonomy in one move. He's a wise conqueror in many ways. Alexander announces that the Lydians would no longer be bound by the judicial system and laws of the Persians, nor would they be to be forced to accept those of Macedon. Instead, the old laws of the Lydian kings were to be reintroduced, presumably under native judges and systems of administration. So also smart. Uh, give the Lydians who had been conquered previously by the Persians, give them back their traditions, give them more freedom than they had while the Persians ruled them, and that will make them more loyal to him. Three days after leaving Sardis, Alexander arrives in Ephesus, where he also does not have to fight. He is received with open arms. He immediately expels the pro-Persian oligarchy and installs a democratic government. The people who had been under the rule of the oligarchy used their new freedom to pay the oligarchs back by dragging them from their homes and temples and stoning them to death in the streets. Fucking stoned. That's something, you know, uh, thank God doesn't happen very often anymore. Man, getting stoned to death. That seems like a terrible, terrible way to go most of the time. Right, what do you hope for when you get stoned to death? Do you just hope for like a real heavy stone to hit you quick so they either die you know, right away or you end up two days to feel all the stones that follow? What a terrible thing to hope for, right? Uh, it would suck for it to take forever. Like, you know, a ton of painful blows that don't lead quickly to death. Just, just annoyed in your final moment. Just come on, you guys just suck. Can anyone throw a decent fucking stone, you idiots? Come on, the head. I will hold still. Hit me in the head. <sighs> Remind me to never get stoned to death. Uh, being viewed as a much less ruthless ruler than the Persians helped Alexander a ton as he marched across Asia Minor. A lot of cities were more than happy to surrender to get out from under the thumb of uh, who they viewed as Persian oppressors. Alexander stayed in Ephesus, Ephesus excuse me, for a little while and offered sacrifices to Artemis, Greek goddess of the hunt, wilderness, wild animals, moon, and chastity. Uh, gotta, gotta pay some gods uh, some tribute, right? Even if you don't believe in them. Got to convince the soldiers fighting for you that you are fighting for the glory of Greece, which includes their gods. It's likely that he frequently visited the studio of Apelles in Ephesus, who became the only painter allowed to paint Alexander. We know of at least one painting made especially for the Temple of Artemis, in which Alexander was represented holding a thunderbolt, associating, associating himself with Zeus again, old Papa Snake, son of Greece's most powerful and arguably horniest god. Uh, next, still in 334 BCE, Alexander moves his forces to the city of Baalbek. Conquers it, renames it Heliopolis, meaning city of the sun. Definitely a better name than Baalbek. Sounds too close to Balsack for me. Welcome to Baalbek! I, I'm sorry, what? Did you, did you say Balsack? It's Baalbek! Ah, it sounds more like Balsack. How does Heliopolis sound instead? Uh, Baalbek was an ancient Phoenician city located in uh, modern-day Lebanon, north of Beirut. Inhabited as early as 9,000 BCE, one of the world's oldest cities, Baalbek grew into an important pilgrimage site in the ancient world for the worship of the sky god uh, Baal and his consort Asarti, the Phoenician queen of heaven. The center of the city was an enormous temple to Baal and Asarti. Uh, Alexander checked another Persian city off his to conquer list. Also, how cool for him and his men to see strange new lands while they're doing this stuff, right? How different traveling like that must have been when you didn't have the internet. He didn't have travel brochures or documentaries or commercials or any, any kind of images of uh, all the places in the world. You know, and for many places, you, you didn't even have books, just whispers and rumors of what may lay down the road. I think the only equivalent the human race might ever possibly have for something like this, again, is space exploration, right? Far in the future. Uh, it didn't take long for the Persians to take notice of the young Alexander's aggression. After Alexander took the town of Balsak, the Persian king, Darius, or no, I'm sorry, uh, Darius. I wrote this 
so carefully, and I still fucked it up. Uh, Darius the third, not super happy about some uppity Greek pushing deep into his territory and taking his shit. Uh, he began planning a little showdown. When I first read Darius, uh, it's spelled D A R I U S, like Darius, and <laughs> which reminded me of Daryl, uh, which made me think of a king who was not regal. Can you imagine King Daryl? This picture of some dude with a mullet, not a retro cool mullet, you know, like a, just an old ass mullet drinking Bud Light out of a I Love Teddy's beer koozie or something, wearing a poison tour tank top, zebra stripe hammer pants, scuffed up white Converse high tops, not not retro cool again. You know, a guy who says like, fuck yeah, bro. Nice. He says nice a lot. I just felt compared to share that. Uh, I just kept picturing the whole time I was reading about uh, Darius. Just nice. Uh, in 333 BCE, the 22 or 23 year old Alexander moved on to Sidon, an ancient Phoenician port city of Sidonia in present day Lebanon, along with the city of Tyre. Sidon was the most powerful city state of ancient Phoenicia. Uh, first place to randomly manufacture purple dye. And you might think, who gives a shit? Well, purple dye, purple dye made Tyre famous and was so rare and expensive that the color, color purple would become a symbol of royalty for centuries and centuries to come. Fun fact, that's how the color purple became a symbol of royalty from being manufactured at Tyre and being super expensive and rare. Uh, the city itself was immensely prosperous, full of skilled navigators and shipbuilders who grew wealthy on maritime trade. Having heard of Alexander's exploits and his campaign to topple Darius, the Sidonians surrendered to him without a fight. As a show of their loyalty, they even disposed their king, Stratton II, because Stratton was Darius' friend. But Darius would not take this laying down. On November 5th, 33, uh, 333 BCE, Alexander and King Darius, King Darrow, would go to battle. Fuck yeah, bro, nice! Uh, the Battle of Issus was Alexander the Great's second battle against the Persian army and the first direct engagement with King Darius uh, near the village of Issus in what is now southern Turkey. When Alexander learned of Darius' presence in the agricultural rich land surrounding Issus, he quickly moved southward from Gordium through the uh, uh, Cilician gates to the port town of Issus. Although the battle itself would be further south on a narrow plain between the Mediterranean Sea and Amanus Mountains, the port served as a base camp for Alexander's forces, and he left his sick and wounded there to recover. Later, as Darius marched his troops to meet Alexander at the river Panaris, the, I want to say Panera bread there, uh, the Persian king stopped at the Greek base camp where he tortured and executed the recuperating Macedonian soldiers, cutting off the right hands of those who were allowed to live. Fucking Daryl! Classic shady ass Daryl move. Nice. Uh, how fucked up does it make me if my very first thought when I read that was, I wonder how many of those guys who got to live had to relearn how to jerk off with their weak hands. Like, I didn't think like, oh no! It's gonna be so much harder for them to fight after that. Or, oh my God, what kind of work will they be able to find? How can they provide for their families? And I just thought, man, it sucks for someone not left-handed, you know, gonna have to take a while to work out a new kind of smooth stroke. Uh, after learning of this, the Macedonian army especially wanted to fuck up the Persians. Historians have estimated that Darius had an army of between 300,000 and 600,000 uh, soldiers, as well as 30,000 additional Greek mercenaries. Though other more recent uh, historians say he probably had more like 25,000 to 100,000. Uh, soldiers with, with 10,000 Greek mercenaries. A little bit of a, a number discrepancy there. Those big numbers, that's what you get um, when the initial historians are trying to make your victories as big and bold as, as possible to further your legend. Uh, Alexander had roughly 40,000 soldiers, 5,850 of which were ca uh, cavalry. Darius decided to move on Alexander's army, hoping to separate them from the base at Issus. Alexander had marched south from Issus towards Syria, but when he heard about Darius being in Issus, he turned around. Darius moved further south into the narrow strip of land west of the Amanus Mountains, unintentionally putting his forces at a disadvantage by reducing their mobility. The two armies met at the river Panaris. Panera bread, they got some fucking sammies. They had some chicken soup. Oh uh, no, they didn't do that. Uh, the weather was rainy and cold. Unfortunately for Darius, he'd ignore the advice of Charidimus, one of his trusted Greek mercenary generals, who told Darius to divide his forces and allow Charidimus to fight alone against Alexander, who was heading up the right flank himself. Darius ignored this suggestion, primarily because he didn't really believe that this young upstart, this little hooligan Alexander, could actually beat him. After being ignored, uh, Charidimus made the mistake of tossing out a few ill-chosen comments about his Persian leader. Darius, turns out, spoke Greek and perfectly understood the comments, was offended, and immediately had his general executed. It ended up being a mistake, as Darius would then lose one of his most capable generals. Uh, so bad moment for Daryl, and worse for his now Greek uh, dead Greek general. Despite the advantage of numbers, Darius and his men were soon on the defensive, unable to maneuver as they would have liked. Darius's left flank was left flank was hampered by the river valley, mountains on his left, sea on his right. 
Alexander, on the other hand, had plenty of room to maneuver his trusted phalanx formations. His right flank extended to the mountains, his left to the sea. He had three battalions on the right, four to the left, with heavy infantry in the middle. After viewing Alexander's formation, Darius moved his cavalry to attack Alexander's right with hopes of breaking through his right flank. Although hampered by the riverbank and stockades erected by Darius, Alexander and his cavalry moved quickly through Darius's left flank. Attempts to drive Alexander back failed. Alexander and his forces turned toward the Persian center where they spotted Darius. Although Darius's brother attempted to block Alexander's charge, he failed. Darius fled the battle at first in his chariot, then on horseback. Despite a serious thigh wound, Alexander chased him until nightfall on his horse and then returned empty-handed. So that's pretty sweet. One ancient leader chasing another on horsebacks like something out of a movie. Give them nothing, but take from them everything. A little more 300, uh, Gerard Butler right there. Uh, meanwhile, Alexander's left flank under the leadership of Parmenium was having problems with Darius's right but when the Persian forces saw their bitch-ass King Daryl flee, noise, uh, they fled too. Many were trampled to death in a mass panicked exit. In all, according to some ancient sources, the Persians lost 100,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 cavalry, while Alexander lost only 1,200 dudes total. That's probably a little bit of exaggeration. Modern historians estimate that Darius lost uh, around 20,000, and Alexander around 7,000. Seems more realistic. But a crushing defeat for the Persians either way. The Persians left so quickly that most of their possessions were left behind for the Macedonian army to plunder. Darius' tent was full of splendid furniture, gold and silver that was reserved for Alexander. And there was more than that. Darius' mother, wife, and two daughters were found in Darius' tent. And Alexander promised them that they would come to no harm. They would be provided with everything they were used to receiving from Darius. Oh man, too bad phones didn't work back then. Alex could have called up uh, old Darius, you know, told him about taking his family. Hey, Daryl! I got your fucking mom, bro. Noise. What? What? No, bro. No, I have your, I have your mom. I have your wife too. And your daughters. Noise. Dude, stop saying that. It's not noise. It's fucked up. You should be pissed. Noise. God damn it, Daryl. I'm hanging up. Noise. Ah, oh, sorry. I got a little, little more absurd than I expected it to. <laughs> After being captured by her son's enemy, enemy uh, Darius' mother, uh, Sissa Gambus feared for her and her daughter-in-laws and her granddaughter's safety. And uh, as Alexander and Hephaestion entered the tent, she threw herself before the taller and more handsome Hephaestion, begging for her life. She mistakenly assumed that Hephaestion was the Macedonian king, not Alexander. And Alex was pissed. He stomped his tiny feet. He ranted and raved with his little high-pitched lady voice. God damn it, I'm a king, I'm a king! I'm Zeus's son, me! I want some respect. No, actually, he didn't mind. Uh, when she realized her mistake, uh, Sysagambus was incredibly embarrassed, and Alexander remarked that the error, not a big deal, because Hephaestion was also in Alexander. Pretty sweet how those dudes loved each other. Uh, although Darius tried to ransom for the return of his family, promising Alexander half of his kingdom, Alexander was like, nope. Instead, Alexander challenged him to fight again, and they would fight again a second time at Gagamila two years later. After Issus, Hephaestion would be placed in charge of Alexander's naval reinforcements. Uh, in 332 BC, Alexander conquers uh, the Levant, the land along the eastern shores of the Mediterranean, modern-day Turkey, Syria, Lebanon. In a wider sense, this term can be used to encompass the entire coastline from Greece to Egypt. Uh, the Levant, uh, part of a, or the Levant, Levant. Ah, it's one of those words I'm like, it never feels right. It's part of a fertile crescent home to some of the ancient Mediterranean trade centers such as uh, Ugarit, Tyre, Sidon. Making his way into the Levant, uh, Alexander arrived at the city of Tyre and demanded their surrender, and they did immediately. Hey, buddy, so glad to see you. We love you guys. Big fans. Uh, following Sidon's lead, the Tyrians uh, acknowledged Alexander's greatness and presented him with gifts. Pleased with their submission, Alexander said he would present a sacrifice in honor of their god in their temple. Then, then things got pretty tense. Uh, the Tyri uh, Tyrians, not Tyrians, whatever I said earlier, the Tyrians explained how it would be, it would be sacrilegious for a foreigner to present a sacrifice in their temple. And Alexander was like, excuse me? <clears throat> I mean, excuse me? Uh, Azamilk, king of Tyre, promised to compromise. What if Tyre becomes Alexander's ally? They respect him as king and all that, but he does his sacrifices, you know, just like a little, little ways over there. Just do it over there in the mainland, at, in the old temple. <laughs> just not here. And Alexander was like, fuck that. <clears throat> excuse me. Fuck that. Uh, as angry Alexander sent envoys to say this was unacceptable. Not acceptable that the uh, Tyrians had to surrender. And then Asmilk uh, made a really bad choice. He had Alexander's envoys murdered. And Alexander, not happy. And he ordered his soldiers to siege the city. Uh, how he did it, pretty badass. He dismantled much of the nearby mainland city of Ushu. He used the debris, rock, 
felled trees from that city to create a land bridge between Tyre and the mainland. Over the years, this would actually lead to heavy sedimentation that would permanently link the island to the mainland, which is why, though Tyre was an island in Alexander's time, just off the coast, it is no longer an island today. He literally changed some local geography, substantially, to suit his military ambitious needs. After a siege of seven months, Alexander used his man-made causeway, where much of the current city of Tyre now stands, uh, to batter down the walls of ancient Tyre and take the city. Tyre's 30,000 inhabitants were then either massacred or sold into slavery, and the city was destroyed by Alexander in his rage at their having defied him for so long. Another example of just fucking sending a message to other cities. Don't, don't fuck with me. Take my demand seriously. Uh, the fall of Tyre would lead to the rise of the city-state of Carthage, as many of the survivors of the siege were able to escape. Alexander's wrath by either bribery or stealth would settle in Carthage, which had been a small colony of Tyre previously. Carthage would grow to then become the center of the Carthi Carthaginian Empire, a major commercial and maritime power that dominated the Western Mediterranean until the mid-3rd century BCE. Then the Romans uh, would take the ruined Tyre as a colony in 64 BCE when Pompey annexed the whole of Phoenicia to the Roman Empire. Tyre was rebuilt under the Romans, who ironically then destroyed the city of Carthage. The surviving Tyrrhenians had built up, leading Rome to triumph over Carthage as the biggest power in the Mediterranean world. Uh, okay, back to uh, Alexander. By 332 BCE, Alexander had made it to Africa. In February, he visited the oasis Siwa in the Libyan desert, where he consulted the Oracle of Amman. Nobody knows exactly what Alexander asked or what the god replied, but afterwards, Alexander started to think of himself as the son of Amman and the master of the universe. Like, he's He-Man, master of the universe. Uh, I'm guessing another oracle told this guy exactly what he wanted to hear. And again, what else was he going to say? On uh, 332, Alexander conquered city after city. He didn't have a single method of conquering. Sometimes he left cities to uh, their own devices. Sometimes he destroyed them. Sometimes he massacred the people. Sometimes he just raised them to the ground. Sometimes when he was really pissed, uh, he had people brutally tortured. Good example of this occurred during the capture of Gaza in 332 after a two-month siege in which some 10,000 in the city were killed. Betis, Gaza's Persian governor, was brought before him. Though threatened with death, stubborn-ass Betis remained silent and would not bow to Alexander. And Alexander really, really did not like this. So he had heated spikes uh, nailed through Bettis' ankles. That alone sounds pretty painful. Uh, and it was just a warm up. Then this poor bastard was tied to a chariot and Alexander's horses dragged him around the city to slowly die while Alexander watched and gloated. Uh, yay. Uh, 331, Alexander founds the city of Alexandria in Egypt. Alexandria would go on to become one of the world's intellectual capitals but Alexander would not live long enough to see it flourish. Alexander did design the plan for the city, and then most of Alexandria's development would be carried out by his commander, uh, Cleomenes, and then the full expansion of Alexandria would uh, happen under the rule of Alexander's general, Ptolemy, and the rule of the Ptolemaic dynasty that would follow and end with the death of Cleopatra after, you know, as I said earlier, uh, a lot of years of incest. I'm not kidding about that, by the way. Listen to the Cleopatra suck if you're not, if you don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, on October 1st, 331 BCE, the Battle of Gagamila was fought, the second and final meeting of Alexander the Great of Macedon, and Daryl, King Darius III of Persia. Nice! Gagamila was a village on the banks of the river Bumadis. The site, I'm, I couldn't find a pronunciation for that river. Uh, the site of the battle is thought to be Tel Gamel in northern Iraq, the hill that looks like a camel. Darius, who had learned his lesson at the Battle of Issus, brought together men from all over his empire this time, even Indian mercenaries, to take down Alexander. Estimates of his army vary from 50,000 to 100,000 to almost a million soldiers, along with 15 elephants, Elephants, excuse me, although they would actually never get used. Um, he also had 200 scythed chariots, chose Gagamila, uh, which keeps making me want to say Gargamel, by the way, that evil wizard from the Smurfs. Uh, he chose it specifically because the land was wide open. So Darius could use his chariots and deploy his cavalry more effectively than he'd been able to at Issus. Uh, he even had the ground leveled. Like he really did a lot of prep. He placed obstacles. He placed fucking booby traps to impede the advances of Alexander's forces. He wasn't fucking around this time. Just no way, bro. You bring that shit. Still pissed about you taking my mom, dude. You took my wife and family, bro. Uh, Alexander made camp several miles from Darius. His estimated 40,000 men would only take their weapons to battle. Nothing else. No, uh, no side chariots, nothing like that. Alexander went on a scouting trip before the battle. Luckily, while on the scouting trip, he came upon an advance party sent out by Darius. 
While some of the party did flee and escape, others were captured and reported on Darius's numbers, the presence of the booby traps, the obstacles, etc. The night before the battle was set to begin, Alexander held a council with his generals. Uh, Parmenio, the commander of Alexander's left flank, suggested that a large size of Darius's forces called for them to sneak attack at night. But Alexander was like, nope. He thought that would mean they would uh, steal the victory. He didn't just want to win. He wanted to win in decisive and bold and memorable fashion. He wanted to continue to build his legend. He was very cognizant of his legend. He also thought the battle would just, you know, go his way, whether he fought it day or night. It had to. Because an earlier eclipse of the moon that he saw was obviously a sign of his victory. This dude loved to read into everything. Everything was a sign. Everything was an omen. Cracks me up. Hey, Alexander, did you see that the family of, uh, there was a family of raccoons uh, eating some garbage in, in our camp last night? Of course I saw them. It was a sign. A sign that I am destined to one day dine with the gods on Mount Olympus. Oh, oh yeah, okay. Haha, <laughs> shit, I, I see that now. First I thought I was like just some random garbage eating raccoons, you know, but I get it. Hey, one more thing. Uh, looks like we got some mice in the grain. Looks like some mice have gotten in the grain. Of course the mice have gotten into the grain. I know. Those mice eating our grain are an obvious omen that I will feast upon the blood of the Persians tomorrow in battle, that I shall go down as the greatest military mind the world has ever seen. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, sure, I, I thought we just had like a, a mouse problem. Uh, that's great news. Uh, on the day of the battle, Alexander reportedly overslept on purpose. Boom. He's not worried. Uh, he really didn't sleep extra on purpose. He wanted to make sure his men were well-fed and well-rested. Uh, Darius's men, on the other hand, they've been awake all night. They were panicked. They were waiting for a night attack that never came. Then when the two armies met on the battlefield, Alexander called out to a weary individual Persian soldiers by name, speaking of their bravery in other battles. I just, it was smart. You know, uh, stroking their egos, asking them to turn and fight for a worthy leader, fight for Macedonia. Uh, as he spoke, an eagle flew overhead and towards Darius, obviously Zeus or Papa Snake. Clear cut omen for victory. He really did think that. Uh, the battle began. Alexander and his companion, uh, you know, cavalry took position on the right flank while Parmenio held the left flank, stationed in the middle with a well trained Macedonian phalanx with more light infantry and archers on either side. Right about time he started fucking around with some arrows. Alexander also placed infantry at angles on the ends of both the right and left flanks to protect against a possible flanking maneuver by the Persians. As the battle began, Alexander and his cavalry immediately moved to the right at an oblique angle. Following Darius's orders, the Persians, under the leadership of Bessus, moved to their left, countering Alexander in an attempt to outflank him. But Alexander kept pushing him to the left further and further until the Persian army was on terrain that had not been cleared. And there was a gap between the Persian left flank and the rest of the army. Seeing an opening, Alexander formed his men into a wedge, quickly charged, moving to their left into the clearing, now heading straight for Darius. Darius sent his scythe chariots towards the Macedonian center, a move that failed to have the effect he hoped. As the chariots approached, the phalanx merely opened ranks, allowed for the chariots to pass through. The infantry then immediately attacked the chariots, dragging the Persian riders uh, into hand-to-hand -hand combat, killing them easily. Back on the right, Alexander spying Darius actually threw a spear at him and apparently missed by inches. Just like at Issus, Darius realized that victory was hopeless and he fled. Uh, just bitch-ass Daryl, taking off again. Uh, he wouldn't get far. He would be tracked down by his own men and executed for being a fleeing coward. Nice. Oh, wait, that's, no, that's not nice. Uh, after this victory, Alexander was without question. Now the ruler of the former Persian Empire's land in Asia. He had done what no Greek before him had done and vanquished their primary enemy. After the final defeat of Darius III, Alexander's best buddy, the old horse, uh, Bucephalus, was horse-napped. While he was on way, uh, away on an excursion, it was a big mistake. Upon returning and learning of the theft of his favorite horse, his, his childhood pet, Alexander promised to fell every tree, lay the entire countryside to waste, and slaughter every inhabitant in the region, unless his horse was returned. Like, he was going to fucking obliterate the entire area. Everybody would die. The horse was then luckily returned, luckily for thousands and thousands of peasants who didn't have shit to do with taking it. Can you imagine how nervous everybody was? Uh, the horse was returned along with the plea for mercy. Now Alexander could move into North Africa, adding more lands to his already sizable Macedonian empire. In 331 BCE, he conquered Egypt, what areas weren't already conquered without much resistance. The following year in 330, Alexander conquers one of the oldest cities in the world, Susa, located in present-day Iran. Susa surrenders without contest, and then Alexander, he decides to sack it anyway. I, I guess he was just getting tired of no one putting up a fight. Wanted to uh, let his men and indulge in some uh, more wanton bloodlust. I don't know, maybe somebody looked at him funny. Maybe somebody made fun of his height or voice. 
or just because it was a symbolic city, he just wanted to fucking punch him in the gut. After defeating the Persian emperor, sacking a few major cities, declaring himself king of Persia, Alexander found himself in Persepolis. Persepolis was known to the Persians as Parsa, which meant city of the Persians. The Greek name Persepolis uh, meant the same thing. Persepolis housed the greatest treasures, literature, and works of art from across the Archimedes. Oh, man. Archimedes. Oh, man. Ar oh, this I was doing so well in these words. And then this one, my brain's just like, nope. Achaemenid. I think it's Achaemenid. Achaemenid Empire. Uh, A C H A E M E N I D, a Chemedid Empire, I think. Alexander would burn it to the ground. The reason why is a bit complicated. It goes back a century or so in Greek history. Before Alexander defeated the Persian Empire once and for all, Greek city states had fought the Persian Empire off and on for centuries. Xerxes, the first son of Darius I, had invaded Greece in 480 BCE, burning villages, cities, and temples, including the great Parthenon of Athens. The 480 BCE invasion of the Persian Wars was long remembered by the Greeks, and when Alexander arrived in Persepolis, he wanted some payback, some old-time payback. And also, he was drunk. Historians, seriously, historians note that Alexander's men were drunk when they decided to destroy the city, uh, and it played likely a substantial role in how far they took things. Uh, one of the greatest cities in the ancient world was destroyed, mostly because some dudes got drunk and worked up. Just fuck these guys, bro! Come on, dude! Dude, listen. Hey, dude, listen. They fucking ruin our shit, man. These guys ruin our shit and fuck them. You know, come on, bro. Burn them. Not all. Burn them some, you know. You fuck them. Who cares? Dude, just a little bit of burning them. Uh, when Alexander the Great arrived in Persepolis, it was among the most impressive cities in the world. When he left it, it was a ruin whose spot will be known for generations to come as the place of the 40 columns referencing the only remaining palace columns left standing in the sand amongst the ruins. Persepolis sacked, plundered. Alexander's men plundered homes, slaughtered families, took an abundance of silver and gold. Initially, Alexander spared the royal palace, not because he wanted to save it, no, because he wanted it raised completely to the ground instead of being plundered. The master didn't spend an entire day plundering, killing the men, killing many of the children, dragging many of the women out of their houses, making them sexual slaves. Then Alexander sobered up, supposedly regretted his actions the next morning, and would continue to regret them for the rest of his life. That is an epic hangover. Oh my God. Oh, my, head, my head is fucking killing me. I got so fucked up last night. I can't, what do we do? What, what? We burned it, the whole thing to the ground? Fuck. No, man, Persepolis was super cool. It's gone? I did all of that? Man, I did not think we were that drunk. Uh, the destruction of Persepolis was an immense loss of the accumulated learning, art, and culture of ancient Persia that could not be replaced. The religious works of early uh, Zoroastrianism, oldest continuously practiced monotheistic religion in the world, written on goatskin parchment, destroyed along with artworks, tapestry, tapestries, other priceless cultural artifacts. The administrative records of the city, written in uh, cuneiform, tablets of clay were luckily hard baked by the fire, buried under some rubble. They luckily survived to the present day, provided archaeologists with some information on how the Persian Empire operated and uh, what the people valued. Nearly everything else destroyed that day by Alexander's army, by a drunken uh, army. 333 BCE, when Alexander was 25 or 26, trouble was a brewing within his own command. A plot to assassinate Alexander was formed to take control of the Macedonian army, and it was his buddy and probable lover, Hephaestion, who brought it to his attention. Hephaestion, along with Craterus, called out Philatus, the suspected ringleader of the plot, convinced Alexander that Philatus and the other conspirators should be tortured and executed, including Parmenio, Philatus' father, longtime commander, dating back to the days of Philip. After their executions, Alexander rewarded Hephaestion by splitting the command of his personal cavalry between him and another general, uh, Clytus. In 329 BCE, Alexander got back to conquering, reminding Bactria, a province of the Persian Empire, people who were supposed to recognize him now as emperor, who was boss. Guess who? Not Tony Danza, Alexander. When Bactria rebelled, Alexander and his army quickly marched to suppress it. 30,000 Bactrians had taken refuge in a citadel situated high above a sheer cliff called the Rock of Sogdiana. Sogdiana. Uh, Sogdiana. I think, oh, I think I had it. Alexander sent a message to, to uh, Aramazes. Could not find anybody saying this dude's name. The commander of the fortress calling him to surrender. And Aramazes replied sarcastically, asking if Alexander could fly because he would need winged soldiers to defeat him. And Alexander was like, seriously? This motherfucker's laughing at me? He wasn't about to let some dude up on a cliff 
show him up. He was a son of Zeus and Amun and Philip. He had a lot of important dads. He asked for the best cliff climbers amongst his army, uh, promising the first man to reach the top of the cliff a generous reward. 300 men volunteered, and these dudes just climbed up this cliff, like old school cliff climbing, at night. By the following morning, after losing only 30 men, they reached the top. The uh, Bactrians immediately surrendered, were taken as captives. And although I couldn't find out what happened to their leader, Anamasis, uh, in any of the sources, I am guessing he had his ass tossed off of the cliff. Maybe while Alexander said some cool shit like, who needs to fly now, motherfucker? Uh, according to Plutarch, one of the captives taken in the siege was a young woman, Roxanne. Now I have the police song stuck in my head. Roxanne. I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm, I apologize for that. Uh, with whom Alexander fell in love. While the army and captives sat around drinking, Alexander saw the young, beautiful Roxanne dancing. She must have been so happy. She'd spent a lot of her free time, I'm guessing, dancing as a kid. Really came in handy when her city was sacked. Uh, because Alexander and his army were called to battle elsewhere, a marriage between Alexander and Roxanne would have to wait. After leaving Bactria, Alexander wins a decisive battle against the Scythians, a nomadic people who originally lived in what is now southern Siberia. Their culture flourished from around 900 BCE to around 200 BCE, by which time they'd extended their influence all over Central Asia, from China to the northern Black Sea. The Scythians may have descended from the same ancient people as the Mongols. Uh, similar cultures, similar fighting styles. After this victory, Alexander once again founds a city named after himself, Alexandria Skate. The following year, in 328 BCE, when some Scythian cities of Persia revolt, he sends another message. He destroys at least one of their cities to keep others in line. Resistance in Syropolis, the largest of the towns, irritated him so much that after he captured it, he ordered it to be destroyed and the people slain. Of the 15,000 men defending the town, 8,000 were killed outright. Citizens of another town took refuge in a fortress and then were also massacred after surrendering when they ran out of water. So many massacres. Time traveling Karen would be disgusted. Are you fucking, are you serious? Oh my God. What is going on with all of the massacre? It's not okay. I will never support this empire. I will never be back until the massacring comes to a stop. I want to talk to your manager. I want to talk to your manager about all of the massacring. Get your hands, ow, get your hands off me. Uh, the next year, 327 BCE, Alexander continues to be as ruthless as ever. In the Swat Valley of Pakistan, after beating down opposition from a people called the, <laughs> oh boy, Assassinians, I think I got it, Alexander agreed, agreed to release a group of mercenaries who had fought with them at the siege of Masaga. The mercenaries left, they camped several miles away with their families, and then Alexander was like, JK, you thought you could fight me and live? Oh, shit. He and his army slaughtered their entire camp. 7,000 mercenaries, mercenaries killed. Their families either killed or taken as slaves. Uh, the same year, Alexander marries Roxanne. I, I have the police thing in my head. I will not share it. Uh, his sweet little cliff dancer. Historians debate over whether it was a political alliance or the product of real love. Probably political alliance. Uh, marrying someone from a conquered land. You know, it's something Alexander's father had done on a number of occasions. A lot of ancient conquerors would do it. And Alexander, who'd always been fascinated with Persian culture, would have found uniting the two cultures desirable. Also unlikely that Alexander would have taken advantage of Roxanne without marriage, another violation of his policies. So maybe it was romantic. Uh, after this marriage, Alexander would insist that many of his commanders would take uh, should take Persian wives, which they didn't like. They didn't care for this. Their wives back in Macedonia uh, cared for it less. Uh, little is known of Roxanne following her marriage until a Alexander's death in 323 BCE. Some historians indicate she may have traveled with him into India, may have been at his side in Babylon. It does seem that Roxanne was pregnant with Alexander's child at the time of his death or with somebody's child. Uh, by 326 CE or BCE, uh, Alexander and his men have been away from their homes now for almost a decade. Think about that. Many of his men had wives and children back home, families they hadn't seen in nearly 10 years. They didn't know if they were alive or dead. It's not like they could drop a letter in the mail. I mean, Alexander, you know, could send word back to Macedonia from time to time. You'd let him know what lands he'd conquered, that he was still alive, all that. But it's not like he was gathering letters from his soldiers. Uh, most of whom were likely illiterate anyways. Uh, despite all the conquering, morale getting pretty low. These guys are homesick. They just want to go home. And Alexander will tell them, tough shit! <clears throat> I mean, tough shit! Uh, in 334 BCE, they travel to India. It's in India that he would achieve what many would call his last major victory in the Battle of Hydaspes in modern Pakistan. He and his soldiers are now roughly 6,000 kilometers, over 3,700 miles from home, at Hydaspes, he meets a formidable opponent in King Porus, and his military savvy will be challenged as never before by an unforgiving climate and a new foe, the elephant. He'd seen elephants in that one battle, but they didn't fight him. 
Actually, maybe not even something, but yeah, they were in that one battle, but they never fought them. Can you imagine, by the way, seeing one of those uh, creatures for the first time in battle? And you're not used to uh, seeing a creature larger than a horse. It would come across like some type of Lord of the Rings monster. Alexander's initial march went relatively unchallenged. He'd gathered a number of additional allies along the way, so he had a nice, he had a nice sizable army. When he met King Porus, he didn't expect a fight. He expected this guy to surrender, but the proud king refused to pay tribute, told Alexander if he wanted his kingdom, he's going to have to take it from him. Porus was confident. He believed his greatest defense lay in the uh, Jalum River, over a mile wide, deep, and fast. The monsoon season would make it even bigger, and Porus hoped that Alexander would have to wait for the end of the monsoon season or simply abandon his quest and just go home. Clearly, he didn't know who Alexander was, a dude who had once built a land bridge to an island kingdom just so he could destroy it for offending him. Porus stationed his army along the river, waited to defend his kingdom if necessary. While exact numbers vary, estimates place Porus as having 20,000 to 50,000 infantry, over 2,000 cavalry, upwards of 200 elephants, and more than 300 chariots. While the elephants were new, Alexander had faced again armies that had outnumbered him uh, before and won. He wasn't too worried about the elephants, apparently. He was confident he could kick these guys' asses. Uh, his Macedonian army crosses the river. In a futile attempt to delay Alexander, Porus sends his son to meet him in the water with 3,000 cavalry, 120 chariots, at least meet him at the water's edge. The attempt is a disaster. Alexander kills his son, destroys the cavalry and the chariots. Only a few survivors flee back to Porus. When the battle officially begins with Porus, King Porus himself rides out into battle, riding atop a war elephant. That's pretty badass. Despite suffering several serious wounds, despite his army fleeing from the battle, King Porus fights on, still sitting on that elephant, refusing to admit defeat and surrender. Uh, Alexander's soldiers are in awe of this guy. They think it's pretty cool that he just, you know, won't give up. So Alexander rides out into the battle, approaches the proud, defeated king, asks him how he wants to be treated. Porus responds, he still wants to be treated as king. And apparently, Alexander respected his wish. He told Porus he would remain king if he was allegiant to Alexander. He let him live and rule basically as a governor. This dude really impressed him. How cool is that? He had so much respect for how hard Porus fought. He was like, okay, yeah, fuck it. And no, you can still run things here. I mean, you work for me, but you can, you know, tell your people you run things. Good job, buddy. That's a cool ass elephant. Uh, roughly 12,000 Indian soldiers, 80 elephants died in the battle compared to only 1,000 Macedonians. Uh, after Hydaspes, Alexander continues on towards the Indian Ocean. Sadly, this final march would be without his trusty steed. Bucephalus, at 30 years old, passes away after the Battle of Hydaspes uh, River there. In mourning, Alexander founds a city in his beloved horse's memory and names it Bucephala. This guy loved his animals, right? He would also found another city after his favorite dog, uh, Paradis. Praise Bojangles! Our good boy Bojangles, overjoyed at this news. Uh, Alexander's march to the ocean, not a happy one. His army really, really wants to go home. And they finally prevail over his wishes. At first, Alexander is so annoyed by his army's reluctance, he shuts himself up in his tent and pouts. But finally, after the appeals of his generals and seeing that his men are extremely upset, he changes his mind, and he and his Macedonian army head back towards Babylon on their way back home to Greece. And then Alexander's good fortune seems to fall apart. Uh, the year looked like it was starting off well, 324 BCE, when he married both the daughter and the niece of Darius in a political dual marriage in Susa. Nice! Two brides, one day. Uh, Darius's daughter, actually, that'd be a nightmare. Uh, Darius's daughter, uh, Statira, would later be killed by his previous bride, Roxana, after Alexander's death. Uh, not long afterwards, Alexander and his troops spend the summer and fall of 324 at uh, Ekbatna, where after a night of heavy drinking, Hephaestion develops a high fever. Uh-oh. Alexander would remain by his good friend's side until he shows signs of recovery. He starts to look like he's going to get better, then unfortunately quickly takes a turn for the worse, relapses, and dies. And the king spends the next two days sobbing, in tears, grieving for the death of his friend, grieving for the death of his lover. Besides cutting off his own hair, he orders the manes and tails of all of his army's horses to be cut off as well. A state of mourning is declared, sacrifices are made, sacred fires are lit, Alexander even executed Hephaestion's doctor, impaling the dude on a stake for not saving his lover, that poor bastard. Hephaestion's body would eventually be sent to Babylon where a giant funeral pyre would be built. Alexander also sent an envoy ahead to see what to request Hephaestion be declared a god. Love this dude. Uh, upon his recovery from Hephaestion's death, Alexander returns to plans for expanding his empire, but he would never realize these plans. Roughly eight months after his best friend's death on either June 10th or 11th, 323 BCE, Alexander of Macedonia, son of Philip, son of Zeus, dies in Babylon at the age of 32 after 10 days of high fever. 
There have been lots of theories throughout the years regarding exactly what killed him. Possibilities range from poisoning to malaria to meningitis to bacterial infection to drinking contaminated water to, to other theories. Two weeks before his death, Alexander entertained his fleet admiral Nearchus and his friend Medius of Larissa with a long bout of drinking. Afterwards, he got this fever and he just never recovered. According to Plutarch, when Alexander was asked who should succeed him, he said the strongest. And his empire was divided between four of his generals, Cassandra, Ptolemy, Antigonus, and Seleucus. These men would go down in history as the Diatiki, uh, or successors. Plutarch and Arian would claim that Alexander, though, passed his reign just to one, to Perducus. Perducus was also Alexander's friend, uh, his bodyguard, fellow cavalrymen, and it would make sense, considering Alexander's habit of rewarding those he was closest to with favors, it would make sense that he would choose Perducus over the others. Uh, Perducus would uh, not be able to extend or uh, to take the throne. He would die two years later in 321 BCE. Alexander's successors would turn out not to be so loyal to Alexander's memory and just as brutal as Alexander himself at times. His longtime comrade, Cassander, would order the execution of Alexander's wife, Roxana, and Alexander's son, and Alexander's mother, Olympias, to consolidate his power as the new king of Macedonia, a title he would later lose to Antigonus, uh, just like Olympias killed to clear the path for her son to be the king, one of her son's generals has her killed to clear his own path to the throne. Some real-life Game of Thrones shit. Uh, Ptolemy steals Alexander's corpse uh, as it's en route to Macedon, takes it away to Egypt in hope of securing the prophecy that the land in which he was laid to rest would be prosperous and, uh, prosperous and unconquerable. There he would find, as I said earlier, the or found uh, the Ptolemaic dynasty in Egypt that would last until 30 BCE ending with the death of his descendant, Cleopatra VII. Uh, Seleucus went on to found the Seleucid Empire, comprising Mesopotamia, and uh, Anatolia, and parts of India, and it would be the last remaining of the Diatiki after the incessant 40 years of war between them and their heirs. He came to be new known as Seleucus uh, Nicator, the Unconquered. Uh, none of his generals possessed Alexander's intelligence, understanding, or military genius, but they did found dynasties which, with exceptions, ruled their respective regions until the coming of Rome. The wars of the, the, of the Diatiki, also known as the Wars of Alexander's Successors, would last from 322 BCE to 275 BCE as the successors and their heirs quarreled over pieces of what was once Alexander's vast empire, an empire that really only lasted uh, a few years at its height. Their influence over the regions they controlled created what historians referred to as the Hellenistic period, characterized by the way Greek thought and culture would spread to the east and west and meld with indigenous cultures. According to historian Diodorus, Alexander wanted to create a unified empire between former enemies, which was why he encouraged people of the Near East to marry with Europeans. I love that. Team meat sack, mix it all up. He wanted a new culture that would be embraced by all. And though he wouldn't create this himself, through the Hellenization of their empires, the Di Diatiki would contribute to Alexander's dream of cultural unity, even if such unity could never be fully realized. After the death of Alexander the Great, when the tide of Athenian popular opinion turned against Macedonia, Aristotle was charged with impiety owing to his earlier association with Alexander and the Macedonian court. With the unjust execution of Socrates in mind, Aristotle fl uh, fleed to Athens. He tried to avoid the fate of his mentor's mentor, and he did. Uh, he would die of natural causes a year later in 322 BCE. And this seems like as good a place as any to bounce out of today's Time Suck timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. What a life we just covered today. Man, dude kicked a lot of ass. Never lost a battle. Uh, he did let King Porus live after the Battle of Hydaspes. That's the closest he came, he came to losing. Unreal. Uh, only the homesickness of his army and, and his own early death kept him from continued conquest. Now to sum up, how great was Alexander? Did greatness in the ancient world require becoming a ruthless monster? It's two questions, I guess. Uh, well, to answer the first question, he was, he was pretty fucking great. If you define greatness through conquering... Everything Alexander accomplished, he accomplished by the time he was 32. He ruled a territory, however brief, that spanned three continents and covered nearly 2 million square miles, 5 million square kilometers. Not only was he the king of his native Macedonia, he was also ruler of all the Greeks, the king of Persia, even an Egyptian pharaoh. Uh, he believed he was a god among men, and uh, so did a lot of other people in his lifetime. 
He founded dozens of cities. He conquered much of what was his known world, ruled over a sizable percentage of said known world. He brought Greek culture and the Hellenistic age to Asia. The great empire he built would spread Greek philosophy, art, and literature all over. He created a Greek-speaking network of trade and military power that dominated the Mediterranean and the Near East for three centuries. Historian Elizabeth Carney, an Alexander scholar from Clemson University in South Carolina, says, It's hard to imagine another human being whose personal choices had an impact on more people's lives for many centuries than Alexander. Because of the decisions Alexander made, hundreds of thousands of people died, any number of political entities disappeared or were replaced, and perhaps most importantly, he helped launch this vast cultural enterprise that combined aspects of the Greek and Macedonian world with aspects of the various worlds he conquered. Now for a second question, was he a monster? You know, did you have to be a monster to accomplish what he accomplished? Well, the answer to this question depends on who you ask. To the families of the people Alexander conquered and the soldiers he killed, yeah, probably seen as a monster. But Alexander did live by the values and ethics of his time. The rulers he tortured, they were men who would have done the same to him. Yes, he killed many civilians. So did his enemies. It was just the way of the world at that time. He killed thousands of people, including at times his own soldiers, his advisors, and his contemporaries committed similar crimes. Like many of history's great figures, he was a mixed bag. He could be a murderous, rage-filled, paranoid, religious fanatic. But again, so could many of the men of that time. So I guess my answer is yes, he was a monster, but not a monster atypical for his time. And I think he did have to become somewhat of a monster to pull off what he pulled off. In a time when war meant systematically destroying your enemy, root and stem, Alexander, he was the best at it. It's interesting to think of how the world might look had he not existed. Uh, This to me really illustrates just how great uh, he was, how important. This is all hypothetical, of course. A lot of my speculation here. But without Alexander, very likely that the Persian Empire would have been able to keep going for quite some time, possibly a real long time. If it would have been able to maintain its trading routes, the world today might be a lot more Persian than it is, especially if the Persian Empire had been expanded into Europe and would, you know, possibly could become the most influential empire on that continent over subsequent centuries instead of Rome. Think about that. The Greek cultural influence that helped shape and define much of the Western world would have been greatly curbed. Aristotle's philosophy would not have spread in the same way. The way the world actually thought could have shifted, probably would have shifted. Alexander's triumph marked what some historians argue was the first time that the Western world uh, took a place of global dominance. Had it not, other nations like the colonial powers of Britain, Spain, France, and Portugal, would they ever have even existed? How differently would the Western hemisphere look now? Who would have colonized or settled it? The whole world might look very, very different today if you just made one man, Alexander the Great, disappear from it. Not only did his conquering greatly shape the world, his legacy and legend inspired and affected many other future conquerors who would also greatly shape the world, like Julius Caesar, Napoleon Bonaparte, many others who may not have ever done what they did had he not existed to inspire them. Crazy to think about how much one person can influence this gigantic world of ours. Interesting to think about how uh, maybe someone right now, alive right now, might influence tomorrow that way. All right, now let's look at some uh, takeaways from Alexander the Great's fascinating and bloody life. Noise! Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, Alexander won every battle he participated in while leading his men from the front lines. After inheriting the Macedonian throne at 20, when most people today are college sophomores, At that age, Alexander would spend over a decade kicking so much fucking ass on one battlefield after another. Number two, Alexander the Great may have been, even probably was, gay. He was not known for being sexually interested in women, and though he did eventually uh, marry a few times and have a child, it may have all been simply for political reasons. He certainly wasn't kicking out heirs left and right like that other conqueror we've covered, historical horn dog Genghis Khan. The loss of his best friend, Hephaestine, and possibly his lover, Hephaestion, excuse me, was one of the darkest days of his life, and Alexander was deep in mourning for weeks, even petitioning religious authorities to have Hephaestion declared an immortal god. Number three, Alexander had a horse, Bucephalus, that he rode into nearly every battle after he used his quick thinking to tame this horse that no one else could ride. He named a city he conquered after Bucephalus, uh, after the horse died at 30. Like so many of us mere mortals today, this dude loved his pet. Uh, Why does that make me like him even more than I would if I didn't know that? Praise Bojangles and praise Penny Pooper and Ginger Bell. Uh, Number four, deeply religious Alexander was inspired by Greek history and religion and saw himself as a descendant of Zeus. Oh, Papa Snake. He was encouraged in this uh, regard by his mother, Olympias, who wanted desperately to be the mother of a king. 
but also in a deeper way, he was influenced by nearly all of Greek culture who believed that specific groups of Greeks were descendants of specific gods, which gave that group their attributes. Of course, Alexander would claim to be the descendant of Zeus, king of the gods, which meant he'd be king of everything. He was no fool and not short on ambition. He also saw himself as a descendant of Achilles and Heracles. Though probably not true, as we're not entirely sure those people even existed, uh, this belief would give Alexander immeasurable confidence, which must have helped him succeed in battle. Number five, something new. Alexander was a charismatic orator. Dude knew how to give a great speech to keep his men fighting. Uh, Alexander gave a famous speech in 324 BCE to stop a mutiny by his Macedonian troops not long before his death. Men who were angered that he wanted to spend, send some of them home, but not all of them, uh, while also appearing to give a special preference to his new Persian subjects and adopting many of their customs. Alexander first dealt ruthlessly with the ringleaders. He killed him uh, before making a speech to his army in which he berated his troops for their disloyalty. And this is a pretty badass speech here. Needs a little, little scoring. The speech which I am about to deliver will not be for the purpose of checking your start homeward. For so far as I am concerned, you may depart wherever you wish. But because I wish you to know what kind of men you were originally and how you have been transformed since you came into our service. In the first place, as is reasonable, I shall begin my speech from my father, Philip. For he found you vagabonds and destitute of means, most of you clad in hides, feeding a few sheep at the mountainsides, for the protection of which you had to fight with small success against Illyrians, Trebalians, and the border Thracians. Instead of the hides, he gave you cloaks to wear, and from the mountains he led you down into the plains and made you capable of fighting the neighboring barbarians so that you were no longer compelled to preserve yourselves by trusting rather to the inaccessible strongholds than to your own valor. He made you colonists of cities, which he adorned with useful laws and customs, and from being slaves and subjects, he made you rulers over the very barbarians by whom you yourselves, as well as your property, were previously liable to be plundered and ravaged. He also added the greater part of Thrace to Macedonia, and by seizing the most conveniently situated places on the sea coast, he spread abundance over the land from commerce and made the working of the mines a secure employment. He made you rulers over the Thessalians, of whom you had pre formerly been in mortal fear, and by humbling the nation of the Phocians, he rendered the avenue into Greece broad and easy for you instead of being narrow and difficult. The Athenians and Thebans, who are always lying in wait to attack Macedonia, he humbled to such a degree, I also then rendering him my personal aid in that campaign, that instead of paying tribute to the former and being vassals to the latter, those states in their turn procure security to themselves by our assistance. He penetrated the Peloponnese and after regulating its affairs, was publicly declared commander-in-chief of all the rest of Greece in the expedition against the Persian, adding his glory not more to himself than to the commonwealth of the Macedonians. These were the advantages which accrued to you from my father Philip, great indeed if you look at by themselves, but small if compared with those you have obtained from me. For though I inherited from my father only a few gold and silver goblets, and there were not even sixty talents in the treasury, and though I found myself charged with a debt of five hundred talents owing to Philip, and I was obliged myself to borrow eighty talents in addition to these, I started from the country which could not decently support you, and forthwith laid open to you the passage to the Hellespont, though at the time the Persians held the sovereignty of the sea, having overpowered the viceries of Darius, Daryl, with my cavalry, I added to your empire the whole of Ionia, the whole of Aeolus, both Phrygia, something like that, and Lydia, and I took Miletus by siege. All the other places I gained by voluntary surrender, and I granted you the privilege of appropriating the wealth found in them, the riches of Egypt, and Cyrene, which I acquired with fighting a battle, have come to you. Syria, Palestine, and Mesopotamia are your property. Babylon, Bactra, and Sosa are yours. The wealth of the Lydians, the treasures of the Persians, and the riches of the Indians are yours, and so is the external sea, you ungrateful motherfuckers! You are viceroys, you are generals, you are captains. What then have I reserved to myself after all these labors except the purple robe and this diadem crown? I have appropriated nothing myself, nor can anyone. 
one point out the treasures except these possessions of yours of the thing which I am guarding on your behalf individually. However, I have no motive to guard them since I feed on the same fare as you do, and I take only the same amount of sleep. Nay, I do not think that my fare is as good as those among you who live luxuriously, and I know that I often sit up at night to watch you, that you may be able to sleep, you pieces of shit! Noise! Fuck yeah, bro! Time suck! Top five takeaways! Alexander the Great sucked. Had a lot of fun digging into a little different era of history. Hope you did too. Uh, thank you to the Bad Magic Productions team for all the help making Time Suck. Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins, Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley, Script Keeper, Zach Flannery, Bid Elixir, Logan and Kate Keith, running BadMagicMerch.com and the socials, the Bad Magic Baroness and the Art Warlock. Thanks also to Sophie Knowledge and to Evans for all her research. And to all those who've joined the Cult of the Curious private Facebook group, well over 20,000 members who continue to make Time Suck a community. Thank you. Try to be nice. Keep talking. Thanks, Liz Hernandez and her all-seeing eyes for running the Cult of the Curious Facebook page. And uh, thank you to all of our Time Suck trivia players. Next week on Time Suck, Cult, 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 Emmanuel David. Though this piece of shit hasn't gone down in the historical record like other cult leaders. He's not your Jim Jones, not your David Koresh. He is just as big a pile of garbage as those guys. Emmanuel David, born in the late 1930s to relatively normal parents, born as Charles Bruce Longo. And he would eventually be excommunicated by the LDS church and go full cult, cult, cult. Emmanuel David created his own church, which was also a compound and a group of people, including his wife, Rachel, and their seven children, worshipped him as a god. Sweet. Uh, he renamed his followers, biblical names, forced them to undertake long journeys with no provision, seemingly for no reason other than it was what he wanted, made them hand over their assets, and encouraged them to commit small scams to raise money for the group. And that's just the start of this tale. Can't wait to tell it next week. And now let's head on over to this week's way bigger than usual, and rightfully so, Time Sucker Updates. Updates. Get your time, sucker updates. Keeping all the names anonymous today as we update last week's Riot Suck, uh, most of you uh, asked for that. And for those that didn't, I, I just don't want to risk stirring shit up for you. Hope you understand. Uh, here's the first message, a message of hope, change, and progress from Utah. Hey, Dan, new listener here. Love the podcast. Love the emphasis on logic plus comedy. I saw a cool Facebook post today that gave me a boost in humanity and relates to last week's episode about the L.A. riots. The founder of the Utah chapter of Black Lives Matter met with the Utah president of the Fraternal Order of the Police to have a conversation about how they each see things. This was on the Black Lives Matter Utah Facebook page posted September 10th. There's a link describing the conversation. I've also screenshotted it. If it's no longer there, I can email it to you. Uh, yes, I was able to find, I was not able to uh, copy and paste, so I was able to pull it up. And um, very, very cool. It just starts off with the head of Black Lives Matter versus the head of the Fraternal Order of the Police. A lot of technical things. And then it just goes into some yeah, really cool information about the discussion they had. And it, uh, it says he, the uh, head of the police, um, had some great ideas about mental health calls. He has a game changer idea for how to handle those calls. The idea I love the most is this one. I have been asking for funding for police officers to have rubber bullets, uh, guns in their cars. I have been told that my request would cost too much money. He said that police departments often retire old shotguns. Those shotguns can be repurposed as rubber bullet guns easily. This would save millions of dollars and every patrol officer could have less than lethal rubber bullet shotguns in their vehicles. I believe this will save lives. A very powerful part of this meeting is when he asked me about systemic racism and policing. He wanted to know what we meant by that and how they can better understand it because police do not feel as though they are racist. I told them that they probably are not racist, but every person has implicit biases and every person is capable of committing a racially insensitive act. I told him about the Anderson Cooper doll study. Here's a link to that. In the study, which proves racial biases are formed in children by the age of five, I told him why I believe those biases are formed. And then I spoke about the Entman study. I told him we need to have uncomfortable conversations about race and racial biases. I told him what a cop just told me. A cop walked, to, walked up to me the other day, said something to the effect of, when you were a cop and all of your interactions with black and brown people are bad, you tend to treat black and brown people badly. Those interactions actually make biases stronger. I suggested the book, White Fragility. I also asked him for a list of a lot of things that the police have been trying to get past. I told him I would, you know, and it goes on to like, you know, a, a list of more things. And then it says, uh, I've been invited onto their podcast. Uh, the podcast will go out to every police officer who's a member of the Fraternal Order of Police. This may be the most powerful thing I've ever done. I'm a proud, I am proud of this moment, a moment where I got to tell the police who we are and what we've accomplished and what we want to accomplish. 
All we do is change the world around here. Welcome to the Black Lives Matter Utah. Today was a good day. So I thought that was very cool. Thank you for sending that to me. That they're talking, having deep conversations, and going to have more conversations. And that's what we have to have to, to make things better. And that's fantastic. I love seeing you know uh, those, those groups coming together. Uh, next up, covering some spots I missed, another anonymous message. Hey, Dan, just listen to the LA riots time suck. And I think you did a good job overall with a pretty difficult topic. But I think there's some nuance you missed. Full disclosure, I'm a white woman from the South. Not that that gives me any special insight, but I've been fortunate enough to have a black friend who's educated me. First of all, systemic racism doesn't mean all cops are white supremacists. Systemic racism means that the policies and rules that govern our society have supported racism. How does that work? Like this, you start out in 1954 by saying N-word, N-word, N-word. By 1968, you can't say N-word, that hurts you. So you start saying stuff like forced busing, states' rights. You, you get abstract. Now you start talking about cutting taxes. All these things you're talking about are totally economic things, but the byproduct of them is blacks get, hers, blacks get hurt worse than whites. We want to cut this. It's much more abstract than even the busing thing and way more abstract than the N-word. As white people, I think we need to be less concerned with intent, more concerned with effect. Nothing but love for you, man, but I don't think this was a racist beating. Saying that was super tone deaf. Who cares if a beating was racist? Why did anyone have to get beaten? Nobody's going to come out and say, oh, I did that because I don't like black people, when it's super easy to make up some reasonable sounding bullshit. We need to stop excusing people for not meaning to be racist when their actions hurt people because they don't just hurt the people immediately involved. When videos circulate online of a black person getting beaten or shot, it's traumatizing to the people who watch it. Imagine if all the viral videos on the internet showed a Dan Cummins lookalike getting the shit beat out of him over and over again. What would that do to you emotionally? I'm not anti-cop. My dad is a retired police officer. I understand they have a hard, dangerous job. But if even a few dozen videos, but even if the few dozen videos I've seen of police officers being violent with protesters are the only ones, still too many. We need to change the way we train police officers to equip them to better handle situations without violence so everyone goes home at the end of the day. It's not a few bad apple situation. We have to change the policies and systems that support the parts of law enforcement that aren't working. I highly recommend the book How to Be Anti-Racist by Dr. Ibram Kendi. That book really changed the way I think about race and racism. Being anti-racist boils down to being a better meat sack to other meat sacks. We should all be able to get behind that. I refuse to apologize for the long email. Thanks for sucking such an important topic. Keep up the good work. Hail Lucifina. Well, thank you. Uh, kicking out the content, I didn't have time, for example, this week to read the book you recommended, but I wanted to list it so that listeners who uh, maybe have more time than I currently have right now can uh, hear that recommendation and read it themselves. Hopefully, I will get to it. Uh, your description of of what if all the people who were beaten looked uh, like me? That was very powerful. Uh, that one definitely hit me uh, differently emotionally. And you're right. Uh, the effect matters more than the intention. If the effect of our current law enforcement legal system uh, and how taxes affect social programs, et cetera, is you know, to continue to create socioeconomic disadvantages for people of color, then, then we can't just ignore that. Uh, I'm glad the current BLM movement is already creating policy changes in many places to try and balance the scoreboard a little bit Thanks for making me think about all this in a little different way. Uh, now a former anonymous police officer, uh, a former police officer who's anonymous, not a former anonymous police officer. That's a weird way to phrase that. Uh, he used to be a police officer, but he was anonymous when he was, no. Uh, he shares another interesting perspective, writing, hey, Dan and crew, as a former deputy sheriff, I wanted to weigh in briefly on use of force against a suspect on PCP. My very first time using force as a cop was against a person high on both meth and PCP. To give some quick background, we initially were rushing in to aid him in the county detox facility because we've been told he was attempting to hang himself. This man was approximately five foot ten and probably a hundred and ten pounds, if that. I'm six foot three and was about two hundred and sixty-five pounds at the time. This is one of the longest and most difficult quote fights of my law enforcement career. It took eight deputies over ten minutes to subdue this person so he could be transported to the hospital. Granted, because he hadn't committed a crime or hurt anyone, we avoided hitting and relied more on trying to overpower and subdue him. Due to his inability to feel pain and his meth strength, as we called it, it was nearly impossible to make him do anything we wanted him to do. The only reason we eventually succeeded was due to his getting physically exhausted before we did. Meth, PCP, even alcohol in high enough quantities all have this effect. I truly appreciate you factoring this into your thoughts when dissecting this subject. Keep it up. Yeah, thank you for this message. It speaks to what I was saying about how violent certain arrest videos are and how they can create such an emotional response of how the fuck could anyone do that? It's just good to remember, not even a video of an incident always paints a picture of the entire truth. If you've never arrested someone high on meth or PCP or someone who really doesn't want to be arrested, who's very strong, how can you possibly know, excuse me, 
How can you possibly know how dangerous it is? How much force it might take to subdue them? You can't know that. You can just listen uh, to people who have been there and done that. And I think it's just good to, you know, think about the, this, this side of it. Uh, next, an anonymous Minnesota sucker has some new stats for us. They write, uh, hey, Master Sucker, Minnesota Sucker. Uh, I've just got done listening to the American uh, Riot Suck. It was great. It made me challenge my beliefs in a lot of ways. Pissed me off in moments. I especially was pissed off uh, at your comment of how black on black crime is worse than police on uh, black crime. This is incredibly ignorant. Let me tell you why. Crime primarily happens in the community one happens to live in. So if most white people live in a white neighborhood, of course, white on white crime will go up. Same thing for black communities. I strongly feel this is an issue meant to distract from other more important issues and not talking about this like you did other points was a bit unsettling. Sorry if this is a bit bitchy, but it's frustrating. I also want to add, uh, if I can, if I can on whether, or I also want to add, sorry. Uh, he wants to talk about uh, whether or not police are institutionally racist. A lot of this comes from the very history of the police, how they directly arose from slave patrols to groups paid by companies to suppress union protests to where they are now. Another reason is that historically hate groups and white supremacist groups have made a point to infiltrate police departments. Here's a link to an article about that. In the article, there's a document on the FBI's findings on this. Uh, with all this, I hope it's a bit easier to understand why people would think the foundations of the institution itself might be corrupt. One last thing is police unions and self-investigations. They may help with benefits and all that for our officers, but they also make it nearly impossible to arrest and charge police officers who have broken the law. And even if they are being investigated through a, uh, they're investigated through a biased lens by friends and coworkers. One last thing I promise, there's an Instagram page I may or may not have created called time suck underscore fun underscore facts. It's exactly what it sounds like it's for. I'd love it if you could give it a shout out so more people can check it out. Anyways, love the show. Keep it up or whatever people say at the end of these. Well, thank you, Anonymous. Uh, first, I uh, I did check out the uh, Instagram page. and It's very fun. Uh, for that that uh, time suck fun facts. Nice job and thank you. Uh, and I checked out the link to the FBI investigation. Here's a quote from that little excerpt for everyone. It says, as revealed in an October 2006 FBI internal intelligence assessment, the agency raised the alarm over white supremacist groups, historical interest in infiltrating law enforcement communities or recruiting law enforcement personnel. The effort, the memo noted, can lead to investigative breaches and can jeopardize the safety of law enforcement sources or personnel. The memo also states that law enforcement had recently become aware of the term ghost skins used among white supremacists to describe those who avoid overt displays of their beliefs to blend into society and covertly advance white supremacist causes. In at least one case, the FBI learned of a skinhead group encouraging ghost skins to seek employment in law enforcement agencies in order to warn crews of investigations. So yeah, that's obviously very concerning. It doesn't say how extensive it is. It doesn't appear to be that extensive, but it's, uh, yeah, it's disturbing that they're trying to do that. And I, like most uh, people, uh, most of all good officers, uh, obviously want these people to be found and removed from law enforcement, and they are being removed. Uh, a lot of racist law enforcement officers have been fired this year. I've read numerous articles in 2020 about incidents like that, and it's fantastic. It's great that current protests have led to more investigations, to getting rid of a lot more bad apples. Uh, as far as neighborhood crime goes, yes, most crime does go down in one's own neighborhood, which is why white on white crime is common in white neighborhoods, black on black crime common in black neighborhoods. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, when I commented on black on black crime, I was just stating that per capita, there is more of it. Do I think that's reflective of race? No. And I said that. Uh, it's reflective of poverty. And I brought it up out of concern, concern that less law enforcement and especially crime-ridden neighborhoods could lead to more victims of crime in those same neighborhoods. And I thought and continue to think that would obviously be so tragic to take a bad situation and despite the best intentions, make it worse by overly defunding the police. And I do know that the defund the police movement does not equate to eliminating the police. I got a lot of emails about that. Uh, I would have had to record a 12-hour episode minimum to even start to properly address all of my thoughts on this incredibly complicated topic, uh, the topic of American racial injustice, how the criminal justice system has factored into that, uh, how today's various social movements um, are, are operating, what they stand for, what they hope to attain, etc. It's a huge topic. Uh, my primary concern with the call to defund the police is just uh, safety of everyone. Will sending unarmed mental health professionals, uh, kind of like street social workers, instead of police lead to more deaths and injuries if those social worker types are harmed in, an, in a nation that's heavily armed. Uh, can we afford to send police and mental health workers, et cetera, out on various emergency calls in, in, in very many places? Is there a budget for it? I worry about rural places like where I grew up in my home county of Idaho County. There's a lot of domestic violence, uh, meth and opioid abuse, and barely enough police to handle the calls as, as they stand currently. They already can't afford to hire enough cops. How are they going to be able to hire, you know, mental health professionals, community outreach, ambassador types, et cetera, on top of that? Not against changing things up, not at all. 
Glad we're going to try something new in many places to make things better for both citizens and law enforcement. I, I just worry if we're going to do it the right way. And, uh, you know, I'm allowed to worry about that. But I'm very, but I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that uh, good changes are coming. I'm with you. I want to make uh, things better for all meat sacks. Uh, another anonymous meat sack shares some new insights from life in South Central LA. They write, hey, I just finished your episode on the riots. Thank you for highlighting the dark side of our history that has been largely ignored. I wanted to give you some feedback as an Angelino. First, I think you did a, the episode a disservice by leaving out key details about the growing tensions between the Korean and black community. Black neighborhoods here and pretty much uh, were, excuse me, black neighborhoods were and pretty much are still food deserts. And the only food stores that uh, many African-Americans had access to were Korean owned. The Koreans took advantage of this, charged insane prices for basic foods, leaving the black community resentful. That was a huge contributor to racial tensions. Then Latasha Harlins was murdered by a Korean shop owner, which was caught on tape. The shop owner found guilty by the jury, recommended a sentence that was rejected by a white judge who didn't see her as a threat, gave her community service. This all happened right before Rodney King. So two injustices back to back led to igniting the extreme race riot. Many BIPOCs feel that the city waited to take action because the police wanted the Korean community to put the black community in its place, considering the Koreans were largely armed and militarized, having served in the Korean army as a requirement prior to immigrating. Just another perspective. Also, I think it's important to note that the movement to defund the police is not the same as the abolitionist movement. Uh, defunding the police does not mean reducing the police force size. It means demilitarizing the police and reimagining public safety. Previously, Los Angeles law enforcement prior to the George Floyd riots got about 43% of the city budget. Any settlements that are awarded due to police misconduct as well as legal fees do not come out of that 43% or the police union, but come out of the rest of the city's budget, which further slashes the budgets of other city services such as affordable housing, youth community programs, job creation, training, etc. Our mayor recently reallocated funds due to the BLM movement, but still LAPD is receiving $3.1 billion, while housing and community services get $163 million. Until we have another Andres Guardo excuse me, Guardado or Dijon Kazi, in which case it would be less than $163 million. Funding community services would help stop a lot of this crime before it starts. As you mentioned in your episode, we could provide the services needed to close the wealth gap, educational achievement gap, and provide affordable health care and housing. Unfortunately, we work with a fixed amount of money, and when every other department in the city is working with less than 10% of the budget, we simply do not have the money to invest in real solutions for our communities. The only choice is to pull from the police budget, not a lot, but enough to help stop crime before it starts and share some of the responsibility for public safety. Anyways, I know this was long, but I just thought you would appreciate hearing a different perspective. I'm currently trying to pass a measure in LA County that would change our constitution so that 10% of the budget will go to community services, no matter who's elected into office. Currently, it's being, uh, currently it's considerably less than that. As always, thank you for your work and dedication to the truth. Thanks to the whole team for all of their work. I appreciate your acknowledging your privilege as a white man and for using your platform to speak out on this matter. A Chicana from Los Angeles. Well, well, thank you for sharing so much information that we did not find. Uh, that was fantastic. And, and it just shows further how complex the problem of racism in America can be. Uh, thank you also for sharing that uh, budget info, for laying that out very clearly. And yeah, that's not going to cut it. We need more social programs that, uh, you know, um, throw more hands down and to, to pull more people up. So more meat sacks are kicking off the race at the same starting line. Uh, another message now illustrating yet another perspective An anonymous sack writes, hopefully this link works. It's a link to the cause of the death of George Floyd. Since you seem so quick to link his death to the actions of the officers, although said actions were excessive, the article states that the medical examiner saw no cause of death linking to as 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 ugh, asphyxiation. Sorry. Uh, note at the end of the article, the examiner says that if Floyd were found dead anywhere else, they would have said it was an overdose death. Out of all these videos lately showcasing police violence, none of them seem to tell the entire story. Uh, I did read the article. And yeah, what you say is correct. Again, oftentimes a video, a painful video still does not show the entire story, even when it looks extremely clear cut. And I wanted to include this as a general reminder to everyone to just to try not to always have a knee-jerk emotional reaction to media, to, to instead first think, wait, 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 wait. What else can I learn about this? What, what other facts do I need to assess here? What's the, what's the whole story? Where's the rest of this story? And again, not saying what happened to George Floyd was at all okay, but there is more to the story than what appears at first glance. Uh, another anonymous meat sack message from Compton this time. All I gotta say is that the topic of this episode was a slippery slope indeed. You did a good job when it came to the history of the riots. However, when you got close to the end and spoke about the civil unrest currently happening in America today and only gave it about 30, 40 minutes, 
pretty pathetic, blatantly stupid. I see you give other topics like the occult and uh, dumb ghost stuff <laughs> uh, more time, yet uh, something is real and very much happening now. You give so little time to speak to the subject. You are seriously just cutting short, summarizing the bullshit happening on the streets currently. You shouldn't have taken this task on unless you were committed to seeing the whole thing through and giving it more time to thoroughly look into everything with more depth, but alas, that won't happen. As a Compton resident, I'm not surprised that a white person wouldn't, couldn't understand how police treat us unless you've been accustomed to watching it day in and day out. Next time you try and tackle an issue that's highly controversial, try and give more time into the subject. But hey, I'm just a listener. What do I know? I hope you see that maybe one day your content gets more time, depth, but until then, wish you the best. Well, I wanted to include this message. But when it comes, because when it comes to really, really complex and polarizing issues like this one, I think we all need to put less pressure on each other to get things, quote unquote, right. My goal was not to perfectly elucidate in under an hour or even two hours or fucking five hours if I had uh, what's going on racially in America right now because that's fucking impossible. It's just an ongoing conversation. Uh, you know, I can't explain everything, what's going on with law enforcement, present a solution on how to fix everything. I'd be in a fucking, I'd, I'd be kidnapped. They'd put me in a think tank and be throwing me food and force me to solve problems. I, I just wanted to start, uh, you know, a, another angle to the conversation. I wanted to share some stats uh, and not hours and hours of mind numbing stats so people tune them out. And share my thoughts and encourage anyone listening to not focus so much on just one aspect of the problem, uh, but possibly other aspects, maybe bigger aspects of the problem that might be, you know, getting ignored. Um, and yes, I do not know what it's like to be black or to live in Compton. All I can do is read articles, dig into stats, watch documentaries, try to explain the situation as I see it best. Hope I get a decent amount right. Uh, and I don't think, oh, what do you know? You're just a listener. I would love for you and others, you know, to share more of what it is like in places unlike the place I live in, you know, to uh, who have lived life from different perspectives. Let's keep this conversation going. Let's educate each other. The more we can talk, the better we'll all understand the better job we can do of solving problems. Uh, three more. Here's another perspective. Hail Suckmaster Supreme. I'm a longtime meat sack, huge fan of your stand-up from way back. I've listened to almost every episode of The Suck. I wanted to reach out to the American Riots episode because you're one of the few people who gave this some kind of balanced approach. You mentioned in the episode that a good question to focus our efforts on might be the underlying reason for the higher crime rate in the African-American community. I think I can provide data that explains one big cause of the massive disparity in crime rates you identified. Single parent households are a huge factor. I know it sounds crazy, but bear with me. A 2019 Pew Research study found that 23% of all children in the U.S. live in a single parent household. This means that roughly a fourth of all children in the U.S. don't have two parents in the home. For reference, the global average is 7%. Even our closest neighbor, Canada, 15% single-parent households. Also, the U.S. has a lot of kids with one parent. What's my point? My point is, it's a bigger problem than we realize. A recent Harvard study went into this in detail. The funding, uh, the study found that when all other factors are controlled for, including race, socioeconomic status, etc., the single strongest predictor of a child's economic fortune is the fraction of single parents in the area where they grew up. Children of married parents have a much better shot of getting ahead in life, even if they are in areas where single parents are the norm. In the words of the researchers, the fraction of children living in single parent households is the strongest correlation of upward income mobility among all the variables we explored. Kids with two parents that are present and involved have a much higher rate of achievement statistically across all races. The same results are seen with a poor white kid in Appalachia uh, as with a single parent as with the poor black kid from a big city. Involved parents make better kids. Don't get me wrong. Some single parents are phenomenal. And as a married father of two, I realize that all of them are under pressures I cannot imagine. However, growing up with a single parent can and often does limit opportunity as a single parent has to juggle more things. It's hard to do everything alone. There are less opportunities for that incredibly important one-on-one -on -one time that children need. Kids who don't get that attention and nurturing are severely impacted as they get older and limited in their success and opportunities. The lack of success and opportunity, as you noted, is what drives many into criminal activity. This makes single parent households a pretty good indicator or predictor for criminal activity, being arrested, etc. And while correlation is not causation, the research suggests they are closely linked concepts. So we've established that one fourth of the kids in the U.S. don't have both parents and having both parents is the biggest predictor of success. Well, the numbers get more interesting if you dive even further. The Census Bureau releases data on the makeup of families across the U.S. and breaks that data down by lots of groups, including race. In 1992, 94% of African-Americans segmented nuclear families were composed of an unmarried mother and children. Single-parent families roughly twice as prevalent in African-American families as they are in other races. The gap continues to widen year over year. I know it's not the only thing at play, and this is a massively complicated issue, but I had hoped you would bring it up and was surprised when it didn't come up. It needs to be a bigger part of the discussion. I know there are a lot of other problems, but I feel like the family is a great place to start. How do we fix it? 
Be a good meat sack no matter what your race. If you decide to have kids, be present. Spend time with your kids. Be there for them. Thanks for your balanced approach. Sorry for the lengthy email. Keep being a kick-ass dad. Fucking love this message. As someone raised for many years in a single-parent household, my parents got divorced when I was seven, uh, as a kid who could have easily ended up in prison for all of the angry criminal shit I did during my teens, yeah, this makes sense. Things would have been better if both parents would have been more consistently involved in my life, my childhood. I think about this a lot with my own kids now, especially since I've been divorced. It is hard for single parents, very hard, right? Compared to uh, dual parent households. Thanks for sharing another part of this gigantic fucking puzzle uh, I never thought of. Another perspective now from an active police officer. So I'm listening to the 1992 riots episode. As a law enforcement officer, I'm in no way, shape, or form. I, I no way... I in no way, shape, or form, sorry, agree with the beating of Rodney King. You nailed it when it came to arresting someone that doesn't want to be arrested. The adrenaline boost that people get when fighting the police is insane. The police also get an adrenaline boost because at the time, it's survival instinct for the police. We get super jacked, just like the suspect. We're trained and conditioned to use force above the force of the suspect. We fight to neutralize the suspect as it could cost us our lives. We don't use equal force because, like I said, we're trying to survive and go home to our families. I don't know what it all happened with the King beating and it was likely way excessive. So don't get me wrong. I don't agree with it, but people don't understand what we go through as officers long before the times that have approached us up to this point, people have wanted to kill police officers. That being said, we are always on edge waiting to be attacked, pumping gas, buying a bag of chips, sitting in a parking lot, trying to do paperwork. Any and everyone that looks our way, we have to assume they could mean us harm. Granted, they may, that might not be the case, but we don't know that at the time. I know you support us, and God knows I appreciate that shit a thousand percent. But as far as listeners go, they have no idea what we go through. Most don't. Yes, there are bad cops, just like there are bad doctors, bad firefighters, bad nurses, all of the professions. Yes, we have guns. But we never want to or plan to use them. I could go on and on, but you get it. Love you, man. Thanks for what you do. Hail Nimrod. Well, thanks, man. Love you, too. Yeah, I don't think many understand the psychological stress of having a job where so many people fucking hate you. Where a decent amount of people literally would like to kill you. Uh, thank you for giving us a little glimpse, a little window into what's that like that should also be part of the discussion. One more. I wanted to end on something that shows how important it is to talk about all this. A maternal meat sack writes, hi there, long-time listener, first-time caller. I'm a mom to three boys, a freshman in high school, a sixth grader in his first year of middle school, and a toddler. Yes, I'm crazy, obviously. I'm politically active and engaged. My kiddos and I talk a lot about current events, the oldest especially. He went to a middle middle school in Vegas where we live that was very culturally diverse. He was in the minority. Uh, We are white. We had a lot of conversations about privilege, stereotypes, racial inequality. A lot of what he saw firsthand was hard for him to understand. Fights, drug dealing, talk of teen pregnancy. His middle school assistant principal was literally jumped by a bunch of girls on the last day of seventh grade. Mind you, this was a good school, a magnet school, and he was an honor roll student. Fast forward to the world we live in now, he barely has access to social media, but what he's seen is dark and confusing. Riots are bad. Police brutality is bad. Is is it racist? What about this? Insert violent encounter here. What about this guy? Do people hate me because I'm white? Holy shit. These are not the conversations I thought I'd be having. As knowledgeable as I am, I was not prepared. I'm very liberal, gun-owning, pre-existing condition having, formerly single mom that now owns a medium-sized business. Thus, I understand the importance of nuance. Tribalism is a poison. So is feeling forced to choose a side when it's so much more complicated than that. There is truth to be found if you look hard enough and regardless of how the truth is received, we can all rest easier knowing it exists. With that all said, sorry for the, sorry, not sorry for the long message. I told my teen to listen to your most recent episode on American riots. You do a better job than I ever could explaining that it's a complicated and hard and sad issue, but not as bleak as it seems. There are very real things we can focus on as a state and lo- on the state and local level to affect positive change. So thank you. After listening to the whole back catalog of episodes, as you and yours coaxed me to sleep through a terrible battle with insomnia, this pod was made for insomniacs, you went and surprised me with a new way to open a dialogue with my teenage boy about incredibly important things. Not necessarily what I was expecting from Time Suck, but I'll take it with gratitude. Thank you for that fucking message. Thanks for reminding us this is a complex issue. And yes, we shouldn't have to pick fucking sides. It drives me insane. That's not logical to be divided into these two polarized camps is fucking idiotic. And it infuriates me. Uh, Yeah, I have no uh, answers. I currently have no additional insights for this, but I'm so glad we're talking about it. I'm thinking about it all the time. Uh, We have lots of talks at home with the kids all the time. We're going to have more. Uh, We're going to vote based on conclusions. We come to conclusions that will of change as we evolve. We will donate based on the same type of, you know, uh, thoughts and conclusions and evolving conclusions. 
I hope you all continue just to think, talk, learn, vote, try to be the change you want to see in the world. It's the best we can do. Stay safe, everyone, and hail fucking Nimrod. Next time, suckers. I needed that. We all did. That's all for this week, Meat Sacks. Uh, thanks for continuing to rate and review this show. Uh, don't try and conquer any continents this week. I'm pretty sure it's way harder now than it used to be. And it used to be really hard. And keep on thinking and talking and sucking. <laughs> Nice!